All right, well, good morning. I'm Steve Thompson, president of Emory Thompson Machine, and uh, welcome to our class today. This is uh, Christy Brown, our vice president, uh, sales and marketing, and of course, you know Jeff Markow. And uh, a couple of ground rules for the class. Uh, everybody wants to hear what your questions are. Uh, a lot of people, I hope you'll have a lot of questions, and you know, you think, well, maybe it's a silly question, but everybody wants to hear it because they're thinking the same thing. So when a question comes up, uh, you know, raise your hand, one of us will acknowledge that we see you, and then we'll, as soon as we finish talking, which is, you know, there's very little space between sentences when Jeff and I are working, uh, we will get right to your question, because it's important we answer it now instead of, say, a half hour later. And uh, uh, during the COVID years, what we found out is people were sitting there and not asking questions, and then at the, during the lunch break, they'd all rush up. And, and ask questions, and that's not what you want, you know, back when we were all trying to be socially say, distant. Isn't it great now to see a full class? Oh, it looks wonderful. Right? Uh, yeah, we upped the uh, amount of people that we could take to the class. So it's we a used to house. limit it to 3,500 during COVID. If you're on TV, half the balcony was empty. Now the balcony is full and the back of the loge is full. It's about 6,500 now. You know what? That joke didn't work in 2008, and it's still not working. Well, you don't know that. You're not on the other end of the camera. <laughs> okay. So um, you're free to walk around um, if, if you get bored. And uh, Jeff will be offended, but I won't. If you want to get up and leave the room and then come back, if you want to smoke, you can go outside. Uh, just make sure uh, Stella and Sammy, the two golden retrievers, don't follow you outside. And uh, we're going to try to answer a lot of questions today and, and make some ice cream and have a little fun. Uh, I guarantee by the time we get down to the last flavor and I ask you, would you like to see one more, you're going to be going, no, 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 no more, because you will have had so much ice cream and sorbet and everything else. Uh, Christy is going to be in and out of the room today. She's usually working with the three of us, but we're one person down uh, in the office, and so she's got to fill in there. And, uh, all our employees are pretty much cross-trained on every single job uh, that we do in here. Uh, the lead man for the uh, 24 and 44 courts, Jerry, is often on the phone answering questions uh, if Mike isn't available. Uh, so uh, Christy can easily step in. Actually, she began her career as uh, running the um, parts department and is now uh, vice president of sales and marketing. So she's come a very long way. Her sales are almost more than mine, so I had to learn to deal with that. So yeah. we'll see you later. All right. Bye, Thank guys. you. Uh, Jeff's going to go first, uh, making his now world famous cannoli ice cream. And while he's doing that, I'll be in the background making faces at him and uh, st sanitizing the machine. So we're going to get things uh, ready to go. We're going to use this is a 24 quart. This makes uh, just to explain what that does. Uh, let me pull these out. It doesn't matter whether these are two and a half or three gallon tubs. The machine will make either two and a half or three. Uh, the one we're going to use today is going to make one tub full. Uh, this one is going to make two tubs full. I'm going to run the CB350. That's going to make half a tub. And then the 200 makes a quarter of a tub. Uh, they're all of the same design. Uh, you'll see the uh, dashers. Uh, that's an old-fashioned term for beater. Uh, you'll see them over there. Uh, everything is the same construction. Just because a machine costs less, uh, it's only because of its size, not its quality. So I'll stop talking and turn it over to you. That ain't going to happen. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, keep those out. You've got to sanitize the machine. Right. Thank you. Uh, what he's doing is what I do in the evening after... Uh, we finish up. You have to sanitize them. Look how serious they all are. <laughs> Look at that. Nobody's smiling. Oh, they'll lighten up. Uh, we have to sanitize the machine. And there's a contradiction there because... Yeah, Jeff's the, wrong. The, <laughs> the minute you sanitize it, it's not sanitized anymore. Uh, I um, don't do it in the morning. Excuse me. I don't do it in the morning because... I used to use Clorox to do it, and this is pretty much the same effect. But the smell of it in your ice cream machine is incongruous to the ice cream. So I never did it in the morning. Uh, if I ever had to do it in the morning, I would wait an hour. I'd go read a book and air us, fan the machine out, get that smell out of there. 
Go ahead. I had, well, I partially <laughs> agree with you because I'm going to, partially, I'm going to rinse the machine after I put the sanitizer Which through. defeats the whole purpose. Well, that's what the health department says because they say your water is contaminating well, the course. machine. And then, you know, I'm a New Yorker, so I've got to argue with everything. I go, so what do you think my Italian ice is made out of? It's water with a little sugar and a little flavor. So, you know, your, wa your machine is only as clean as your water supply is what it comes Did down to. Did you put to. that in here yet? Yeah. Okay. So you continue on. So that's the story on sanitation. It's, it's really an illogical oxymoron. Uh, it, it works for the second, and then it's done. Then it doesn't work anymore. Whose phone is that? You're fired. Huh. Uh, later, teach me how to do do not disturb, all right? OK, so uh, cannoli. Anybody not know what a cannoli is? Whoa, really? Okay, I grew up in New York, and cannolis uh, were, are an Italian pastry that is injected into a, a round, hollow pastry shell. Uh, and uh, they oftentimes have chips in them, and they sell them, maybe a little powdered sugar on top, and they sell them in pastry shops, and they are really good. Uh, they're not dietetic at all. Uh, <laughs> and a quick story, way back when, about 13 years ago, uh, in New York, there's the cannoli king of Corona, right? Right. And he was famous for supplying cannolis all throughout New York. And uh, without divulging anything, I got the recipe. Uh, which is guarded. It's a guarded family recipe. And as soon as I got it, I said I set to adapting it to ice cream. And I made the ice cream. And the ice cream was very good. I didn't serve it in the shells, although I had the shells there. Uh, but to do it the right way, you would, when it comes out of the machine, you extract, extrude it into a pastry bag. And then all you do is you have the shells and you, you know, shh, shh, that stuff. I didn't do that. I just made the ice cream. Uh, now, I made it once, about 12 years ago or so. And the reason that we don't make it all the time is twofold. One, a lot of people don't know what a cannoli is. But the main reason is it's very expensive because you use a lot of ricotta. Or as they say, who's Italian here? Ricotta. What do they say? Ricotta. 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 Right? Say it. Ricotta. Ricotta. Okay. I'll never get that. But, uh, so that's, you're done with this stuff? Yeah. yeah no, you have one more to do, right? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay. So that's why I haven't made it. But today we'll make it. You know, uh, sort of a uh, post-COVID celebration. Uh, we'll make cannoli ice cream. So if you want to write the recipe down, I'll gladly give it to you. There are, in keeping with my philosophy, uh, two ingredients. <laughs> We're going to make it in, I'll give you the recipe for a 10-quart, uh, a 24-quart machine, and then you can uh, reduce it. We're going to use a 12-quart machine, so it'll be half that. And if you have the uh, CB350, a 6-quart machine, it'll be a quarter of that. So the recipe is 80 ounces of ricotta, cheese, 80 ounces. That's a lot. Uh, and then 10 ounces of vanilla. And of course, uh, 10 quarts of your mix. So that's it. Uh, now today we're gonna cut that in half because we're gonna be working on this machine here. Is this done? Yes. Uh, so that's it. Um, the bladders, the mix that we use comes in bladders, and I poured, they come in 10 quart bladders. So I took half and put it in here, giving us five quarts of mix. The mix is basically cream, milk, skim milk solids, uh, little stabilizers or something, whatever else they put in. But it's very good. It's, if, you, if you're a coffee drinker and you're in your store, use this. Uh, in your coffee. 
uh, instead of milk or cream. It's, it's wild. Okay, we ready? Yes. So first we'll put this in. Now, I'm not sure, I don't remember whether, I think I'll be able to get this into the machine. You know the drill, the drill gun bit, right? Uh, yeah. That's what I normally would do, but I don't have it with me. So we'll just try to put this directly into the machine. So let's put the mix in first. When you're pouring stuff, pour it higher rather than lower. It creates a thinner stream, easier to control. That's about a dollar fifty tip, I think. <laughs> it's an important one. And also, when you're measuring, I've told this a hundred times, and you have your measurements here or here, and you're trying to pour into get your measurement, you're pouring and tilting. Whereas if you just note what you need, turn it this way, you can pour it right in and watch it on the other side. Someday they'll get smart and put these on the inside so that you don't have to do this. But that day isn't today. All right, we'll put in uh, how many ounces? Eight. Eight. How many ounces? 80 ounces. 80. Once again, 40. how many ounces? 80. 40, who said 40? Andrea, good man. Because we're using the half of uh, the 12 quart machine. Remember? One tub instead of two for a final yield. The 12 quart. Oh, of this one? Yeah. Oh, we'll get more than one tub. Okay. <laughs> here we go. All right, so we'll put this stuff in here. This is uh, arduous. But worth it. But it works, yeah, it's worth it. Do you want a smaller spoon, or are you good? Ah, eh, this will be all right. I don't, really, I don't have another quart to do. One thing uh, on the sanitizing the machine, the last thing I did was take the water out of the machine. So now, if I go over there and I get my ingredients ready and I start pouring it in, it's gonna go all over the floor because the last thing I did was open this up and let the product out, close the gate. If you may have noticed, you'll see we look a little strange because we go by the machine and we touch it. You know, we're not blessing it. We're just touching it to make sure the gate's <laughs> closed because we have live spread dairy mix all over the floor. Yep. So always, you know, just you know, get in the habit of touching your machine. On and the they'll gate do handle. it too. Everybody will do it at oh, least absolutely. once. Yeah. And you'll curse my name because you're pouring it in. It's going all over the floor. And you'll say, ah, the damn machine leaks. I got to call Emory Thompson. No, you left the gate open. So just get used to just tapping it or hitting it there to make sure it's closed. I'm keeping my sanitary water down here. Uh, if Jeff wants to uh, dip a spatula in it to rinse it off, he's rinsing it off in sanitary water. Smelly sanitary water. Yeah, but not too much. Not too bad, not too bad. Okay, so there we have it. 40 ounces of ricotta cheese, yes. Or just normal? Great Fish question. Great food. question. Um, I'll tell you the true secret. Oh, God, I hate to do this. Um, the secret to this ice cream is Sargento's. Have you heard of that? Sargento's ricotta. I can't find it. I looked all over. I spent two days. I went to every Walmart, every Fresh Market, every Publix, every Winn-Dixie, and I couldn't find Sargento's. <coughs> that's a great question. I've never made it with Polly O, but that's a reputable brand. Polly O is a long time name. Yeah, but it's not Sargento's. When I was given this recipe, I was told very specifically, Sargento's. So, so those of you in the audience and the millions around the world who are watching our videos, please don't tell anyone you know, which one you use. It's secret. <laughs> oh, it's secret. It's a secret that I just gave out because I'm tired of keeping secrets. <laughs> it doesn't pay. Like I was talking to somebody from the class and everybody who owns an ice cream store thinks that their information is proprietary, but it's really not. You, what are you gonna open up right next to them? And even if you do, all the recipes you'll ever get, either from me or from Steve or from my book or whatever, you'll change. You'll adapt them. 
because you may make something and you say, wow, that's way too sweet. And he may make it and you say, well, it needs more flavor or it needs uh, to be churned a little less or you'll all adapt them. And that's what's going to make your ice cream store the best ice cream store because you will wholeheartedly with 100% of you believe that you're making the best ice cream in the world. If you follow my recipes exactly, you will, but no, that's right. Okay, so there's the, uh, the ricotta. Now we'll add a lot of vanilla because ricotta doesn't have much, who's it? ricotta doesn't have much taste, right? No. And so you, you just had me smell it this morning. It has no smell. It has no smell. I notice there's no sugar in the recipe. Well, but I put a bag here because I'm thinking before we turn it on, I want to taste this. And if it doesn't That's meet... That's a lot of vanilla. You don't pay for it. What do you care? It's a lot of vanilla. Uh, and if it doesn't meet my expectations, yes, that's why I put that there. I may have forgotten over 12 years the recipe, although they're written down, but a little sugar couldn't hurt. It might bring out the flavor a little more. So and let's say don't forget your dairy mixes, milk, cream, sugar, skim milk. Okay. There is absolutely, I mean, you don't have ice cream without sugar. All you have is frozen milk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, any, even a homemade recipe you look at is going to say milk, cream, sugar, skim milk. And we know in the dairy industry, one more secret ingredient, and that's uh, skim milk powder. Because skim milk powder is heavy cream with all the fat removed. So it's got all the good stuff of the cream, but without the extra fat. We don't want to keep raising the fat level up. It gets to be too greasy. You know, it's, it's, uh, people come in and they say, well, what are you running? Well, here in Florida, I'm running 10%. In New York, I'd be running 14% because it's a colder climate. In New York City, I'd be running 16%, just so I can brag that I'm the richest ice cream in New York. haagen and Ben & Jerry, which we put into business, both companies, are both 16%. I personally don't like it. I think it's too greasy. Uh, it's masking the flavor. And, and people don't eat fat content. They don't eat air content. They eat flavor. Wow, that mint chip was really minty, and the chocolate chips uh, weren't chalky. That, that's, that's what you're selling. You're selling flavor. It's good, but I am going to add a half a cup of sugar. As we discussed this morning, all your flavors are sweeter Sweet. than others. Yeah, yeah. I you know, and we discussed why too, right? Yeah, because you burned ice out cream your taste is a, buds in college, and you can't taste them. What? You burned out your taste buds doing acid no, no, in college, no. and I, you can't taste them. <laughs> what do you mean in college? <laughs> ice cream in my world is a treat. It's a dessert. It's not a bologna sandwich. So when you eat it, it in my world, it should be sweet and a lot of flavor and very creamy. That's what I consider good ice cream to be. You have a question back there? Well, let's go. Let's have a question. All right. So, go ahead. How, how much exactly ounces of um, vanilla you put in there? How much? What would you say I did? You're supposed five. to do five. I made a mistake. I put ten in. I thought it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> because I forgot I cut down the rest. I never use a twelve quart machine. Yeah. So I put in five extra ounces. So what should we do? Don't say it. What should we do to correct that mistake? Add more mix. Do it again? What? Add more mix. Add more mix. That's it. Add more mix, of course. So we're not going to double the amount of mix we add, but we can temper it a little because, you know, vanilla is not really a flavor. It's an enhancer. So we'll add a little more mix. Uh, how much? One quart? <laughs> We'll add another quart. Yeah. But see, they knew. That's how that you fix. Good. Yeah, that's good. Now, that's going to uh, slow down the freezing time because you've added more product to the machine. So if anybody's doing a stopwatch. Uh, but it really doesn't matter uh, uh, that as long as the freezing time isn't like an old salt and ice machine where it takes, you know, 45 minutes to an hour. That makes a very grainy product. But we will up the freezing time here. And now we'll see if it worked. Are you going to add more product, too? No, because I over ricotta not by uh, a lot, but I needed 40 ounces of ricotta, right? And those two were 32 and 16, so 48. So we're eight ounces over, so we're okay there. 
got to watch him, you know? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But again, uh, I'm finding with the, we're up to uh, oh, yeah. 479 videos. We'll be 486 yeah. after this. Um, I'm finding that people sometimes take what I say as gospel and, and don't hear that it's dependent on where you are in the country. And it's on my own personal opinion. Uh, we came down to Florida and ice cream sales in Florida, one of the warmest, sunniest climates uh, on earth, uh, doesn't have high ice cream sales. Because we New Yorkers came down with our too much is, an, is never enough attitude and we're running 14, 16% butter fat. And that's like going into, in, if you live in Florida, you go into Ruth Christ at lunchtime and have a big filet mignon and then walk out into that 95 degree heat with 100% humidity, you're gonna sweat, you're gonna get a stomach ache, you might even pass out because it's just too much fat in your system to take. So the same thing was happening with ice cream. They'd eat haagen and then go outside and they say, oh, that made me feel ill. There was nothing wrong with the haagen -Dazs. it was the fat content, so I lowered it. So in Texas, I might do 10 or 12, it's not as humid. And these are not hard, fast rules. These are personal preference. Certainly up in Ohio, Wisconsin, uh, California, I'm going to run uh, a 12 or a 14. And again, the 16% uh, was strictly for bra bragging rights because there really isn't anything higher than that. I don't really see a whole lot of social redeeming value in going up to 16%. So don't take it as you must use 10% to use Jeff's formulas or my formulas. Take it as it's a general idea and use your own personal taste. Yes. Oh yeah, pennies. But it is uh, you know most of the most of the cost of your mix today is in transportation, getting it to you. Uh, but yeah, it's it's not a huge difference. Yes. So I've seen on some Facebook forums that some stores are having difficult times getting mixed because dairies are going out of business. Have you heard that from some of your clients? Uh, I had this discussion uh, just in case the camera didn't pick it up. Uh, the difficulty of getting mixed. No. Uh, I'm not, but it has changed. Uh, there used to be thousands of small micro dairies, little farms making mix, and uh, a lot of them got out, got bought up by the uh, the big guys. Uh, so the big guys now have wider distribution. But your mix might come. From, you might be in Georgia, and your mix comes from St. Louis. But if you look around, you'll find there's a great uh, dairy. Uh, Greenwood Industries, Greenwood Dairy in Georgia. You just have to, it's a little hard to find them, but you have to look. We keep a list. So all you have to do is uh, write to me, Steve, at emerythompson.com, and we'll send you the list of dairies we'll that we have. Christy, she's got it on a file already. Yeah, the, both of us do. Yeah. Uh, so now, what we are encountering is a severe shortage of cups and straws and Oreos, uh, stuff like that. I think stuff that's mainly delivered in trucks, Cisco, you know, those trucks, I think that's why we're getting a shortage, but I went out and bought all the Oreos I could. You know, a lot of Oreos <laughs> and cups. When, when we used to just keep cups to, uh, you know, what we need this week, now we're buying 10,000 cups at a time because you, you can't run out of cups. You can run out of a lot of things, but you can't run out of cups. No. And if you're starting up a new business, you cannot make a rookie mistake. Uh, you, you've got to look at everything in the store that you're planning to do. So we've just told you that cups are in short supply, mainly because a lot of them are coming from China. Their prices are good and their quality is good. Uh, but you're going to have a long lead time. But I can't tell you how many phone calls we get and the customer says, I've got my store, uh, the serving cabinets are in, the signs are up, we've got the hats, we've got the t-shirts, we're opening in two weeks. Can you send me a batch freezer? No, I can't. Uh, the, the wait time on the CB350 is six weeks. The wait time on the larger machines is 14 weeks. And we're the best in the industry. Everybody else is six months or not at all uh, because they're dependent on Chinese parts. We have no Chinese parts in the machine, so uh, we're constantly building them. My only delay of 14 weeks as opposed to four weeks is because where we might have uh, 40 orders a month, I've got 117 to build. So if you're planning a store, start now. Uh, get, get, that, get your long, lead items, long lead items in and in production. 
because you're going to have to wait. I, un I understand dipping cabinets are even longer, uh, but we have a great solution for that we'll talk about later. <laughs> I have a real good solution for that. Anyway, uh, any questions? Oh, did you notice that I added something else? What? Chocolate chips. When you buy cannolis, uh, they have chocolate chips, or I shouldn't say they have them in them. On the ends, they put chocolate on the ends of the, what do they call that thing that it's in? Tube. What is that called? I don't know what the shell. A shell. So at the ends of the shells, I'm sure what they do is they dip it into chocolate chips. Uh, but I thought, you know, why not put them in there? Can you add the shells to that mix as well? No. It'll just become they'll soggy. They'll get mushy. Too. What? The, the, yeah, the, soggy. They'll get soggy. However, I did think of something, but I forgot to bring it. When when we serve you this ice cream to get the experience, what I wanted to do and I knew to do it and I just forgot. Uh, we make waffle cones at the store and I was gonna break some up and put a piece of waffle cone in each one. Would have been a nice thing, but you don't get it. Uh, but that's what... It would be similar to when they do cookies and cream. The cookies get soggy as well. What would the difference be? Yes and no. Uh, good cookies and cream ice cream. Steve has the answer to this. You put the crushed up cookies in, not at the beginning. Once the ice cream has developed a consistency so that it won't turn to mush. If you put them in at the very end, now I have an, an invention that I'm telling everybody they should do. If you wanna make a lot of money, I came up with the idea and it's yours. Here's the idea. Have you ever been to the uh, candy stores that sell bulk candy? and they have these plastic chutes on the wall, and you take a bag and you go whoop, and it fills the bag up, and then you go pay for it. Why not buy one chute, put it right here with Velcro, and as the ice cream's coming out, just regulate the, the hopper on the chute and add whatever you want at the end. It's brilliant. Make a lot of money. You don't even have to in, in, in do the manufacturing. You can already buy those things. Just get some Velcro and market it to ice cream stores. Every ice cream store in the world will buy it. Worth the price of the cost of the class, right? All right, any other questions? No? So we added chocolate chips. How much sugar is in a bladder? Yes. I have no idea. A sufficient amount to make it ice cream. So you need to add no, you don't. It depends on the recipe. Depends on your recipe. If you're making something that you want a little sweeter, if you let's say you're making cherry cheesecake ice cream, and you taste it, and you want it a little sweeter, so what do you do? But anywhere, if you use vanilla as an example, anywhere across the country, you won't be adding sugar to vanilla. Uh, it's everything is in there. The, the cow is milked about four in the afternoon. Uh, it's brought back to the dairy, it's uh, separated into milk cream and skim milk, and, and then it's re-blended and put through a pasteurizer and a homogenizer. The pasteurizer kills the bacteria, the homogenizer breaks down the globules of fat so you don't have little balls of fat in your ice cream, and uh, then it's bagged up, refrigerated, and delivered the next morning. So it's the freshest product on earth. I was on a bus once uh, on an ice cream tour, gelato tour in Italy, and I made the uh, proclamation that Americans can make better gelato than the Italians can. Well, you'd thought I'd said something, you know, heresy. You know, how can that be? The Italians have been doing it forever. I said, it's really simple. You don't have dairy cattle. You have beef cattle, but you don't have dairy cattle the way we do in the States. So all your products, uh, the, the cows are milked in Argentina, it's put through a machine called a spray dryer, invented by a family friend of ours, uh, and then shipped from Argentina to Bologna. It's put in nice foil bags with the other ingredients, shipped to the port of Elizabeth, and then shipped to you in Ohio. That thing's got more sky miles than I'll ever have, that bag of mix. And then you had to reconstitute it with water or milk. This came from the dairy last night. Uh, from the cow yesterday afternoon and is on your table this morning. It doesn't get any fresher. So uh, you give me an Italian chef making gelato and you give him my blend that the dairy produces, you're going to have just incredible product. 
I don't make good gelato because I don't make gelato. So I'm not well skilled at it. And I think if you go to Italy, the gelato comes in, say, 10 basic flavors. It comes in amaretto. It comes in, uh, what are some of the flavors? Um, Fruit of Tabasco is mixed berries. Uh, right. Tiramisu is number set one. Number. Pistachio. As Americans, we can make gelato out of anything. And we're, we're far more creative and inventive. So we can take any of our ice creams, just like yesterday we were talking about frozen custard. Custard. Custard's really good. Now, we can make anything out of custard. Uh, when is Rod coming back? Rod Oranger? Yeah. Whenever I invite him. Rod Oranger created a product that is just, it's, it's a miracle for the ice cream industry. I'm if you, you want to, what? I'll get you one. Oh, I showed it already. Oh, you did, the Bavarian base? Yeah, it's called, it's right up there, it's called Bavarian base. And it's basically egg yolks. Now, you could, that enables you to take any of your ice creams and turn it into custard. Now, it won't be custard like the custard machines in the other stores that are soft serve, but the flavor will be custard. Very good. Yeah, it's fantastic. So now, a big question is always, what? I was gonna ask Steve a question about mix. Be my guest. So, Steve, I've heard you guys talk in the videos some about mixes that have high fructose corn syrup in them. Are you pro or con on that? For I'm against guess? it, if I, can, if I can possibly do it. Uh, it's hard to find one without it in there. It, it is hard because uh, the price of the dairy is going up and that's one way they're saving money. Um, it's, it's not the worst ingredient. The worst ingredient is polysorbate 80, which is a chemical preservative. And so in any baking, uh, any cooking, any restaurant, there is a bit of give and take. You can't always, you know, get everything you want. Sounds like a Rolling Stone song. Right. <laughs> it's going through my head. Good for you. Um, but um, I, I try to avoid it. You can, hold, hold make on, your, you can make your own mix. Uh, it's, it's complex. It's simple in its process. There's a company called Micro Dairy Designs. Um, and Frank uh, Kipe, or Kip, K-I-P-E, uh, owns the company. He's in Maryland, Micro Dairy Designs. They have a wonderful pasteurizer for uh, about $10,000 that goes well with my CB350. However, the uh, problem comes with the health department. The f now you're under federal FDA regulation. Pasteurizer. And they're going to be uh, you know, visiting you all the time, checking your product. But yes, it can be done. Okay, you had a question. I'm just curious of what the uh, speed was. Your speed is 234, uh, which is, uh, I do everything on maximum. I'm a maximum kind of guy. You know, that, that question comes up all the time, and it's absolutely irrelevant to anything other than to say that we're running at 100% overrun because there's no other machine on earth that's going to run at 234. It doesn't matter. It's what we as engineers at Emory Thompson selected as the way to get uh, maximum air out of the machine. So we could tell you it's 197 or someone else could tell you it's uh, 265. Doesn't matter. It's to their machine. We're the only machine on the market that you can adjust it infinitely. You can take it up and down to wherever you like. Uh, you had a question? Yeah. Um, do you have any say uh, on what goes in the base? No. no. No, because if you take 10 ice cream stores, they're all going to say, oh, you know, I'd like it this way. No, I'd like it this And then they're not going to make any money. Um, it came up, and it always comes up, when is it ready to take out of the machine? You know, you can't go read a book, and you can't be on Facebook. So it's pretty close now. Uh, he pulls it a little later. I. I always laugh when we say this. I pull it sooner, he pulls it later. <laughs> it's only in your mind, Jeff. Yeah, so, no, not really. I heard a chuckle. And, and everyone else. All right, so. It's a family show here. I, try, I judge it when it hits the bottom of the bucket and maintains the peak uh, that it dropped in. If you put it in the bottom of the bucket and it, it flattens out, it, to me it's not ready. But it's close. And then it depends if you're doing a variegate. Remember the variegates? We had to make it a little firmer so the variegate doesn't dissolve. Okay, I think we're ready to roll. What do you think? Go for it. Okay. I can't wait to try it. You're going to have some? Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Yes. So, 
it five quarts in the mix and because of the air content, do you get more than five quarts? Ten ten. Back? You'll get ten back, which is the federal plus maximum. The, plus the inclusions. Yeah. So the you might get 11 quarts chips. out because you put in two bags of cookies. Uh, but the federal uh, government says you can't go above 100% overrun. Overrun is like proof and alcohol. 80 proof liquor is 40% alcohol and 40% other stuff. 80 proof ice cream is 40% dairy and 40% air. But we don't call it proof. We throw in the word overrun. And this machine will give you any overrun that can be done on a batch freezer. We pull softer than the Italians do because <laughs> they're taking it and putting it right into a serving cabinet and serving it as gelato. Uh, it's a low fat product. It's two, three, four percent. We're starting at 10. Uh, the lower the fat content, also the less air you'll get. Uh, but they're trying to serve it soft and we're trying to serve it uh, hardened and then scooped. Uh, plus, as you can see, except Jeff's in the way a little bit, uh, it comes out very, very fast. They take a long time. Every other machine on the market takes a long time to get the product out. Uh, so imagine you've got your tater tots in the oven, and the f they're ready, and you start taking three minutes to get them out of the oven. The last ones out are going to be burned because they stayed in the oven too long. We want consistency and speed. So Jeff's got it ready to go. I'll help you. Yeah. Okay. I don't like doing this. Oh, then I'll take over. No, it's okay. You just hand me the cups. Oh, that's and not put much. put spoons it. ready. Get All spoons right. In. That I can do. <laughs> I had to get my own cup there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got a big crown. Oh, it's great. 16, I think. 100. 1,600. <laughs> We have to serve this too. I'll do that. What am I going to do? Clean the talk, machine? Talk. Talk. <laughs> talk. No shortage of that. No. Oh, question says yes. Did you guys put an entire bag of chocolate chip morsels or whatever they're called? I didn't see how many you put in. Oh, I, I used a bag. The I recipe bag. calls for for a twenty-four for a full batch calls for a quart of chocolate chips. Now chips and other ingredients, hard ingredients like that are interesting because if you overdo it, now the, the ice cream falls apart. And it's got so many chips in it. I did that recently. I put so many chips in that you, you couldn't even uh, practically taste the ice cream. You were too busy trying to chew the chips. Chew the so chips. You can overdo it. How many are we up to? I put out as many cups as we need, I think. Oh, okay. I don't think Mike would want any of this. Of course he would. Might be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> the voice from above. Yes. Any other question right now? Yes, sir. What price point would a cup that size what, what? sell for? What? What price what, point? What, what could I well, sell you don't sell these size cups. You sell a regular 12-ounce cup. And that should be five bucks, tax included. And for this, since you said it was more expensive? Of course, because there'll be other ice creams that are less expensive. It all comes out in the wash, so to speak. You can have the best budget-priced ice cream on earth, and if you've got three people in line, that's what you've got. But if you've got a great ice cream, and you've got, okay, and you've got you know, 30 people in line, now you're making some real money. It's all about the numbers. The more people you sell to, the more money you make because there's so much profit built into it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you the service around here. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> What's what? Well, remember we did this all yesterday. Does it matter what this particular one is? You know, we did a very expensive one. But you see like how I did said, that? I angled the larger one to him. Too. So it all comes out. Uh, 
if you, I, I don't want to you know do the numbers on this particular one, but uh, I don't even know how much the ricotta cost. Rose bought it. Jeff, do you think the ricotta is changing the texture of that? Because it seems more creamy than what we made at the shop. No, I don't think so. Well, I think everything we made was real creamy. I need one more. But, of course, one more. Mm -hmm. Who didn't get one? The lady oh. in the back. I didn't see her when she snuck in. You want to sit up here? There's room. Bring a chair. There's plenty of room. In your book, you say you use Danny vanilla. Um, what was this vanilla? What make was this? This is uh, this is Lockhead. Vanilla is going to come from Mexico, Tahiti, or Madagascar. Madagascar being the main source of vanilla. You'll decide what you like. Uh, some are more expensive. Some are less expensive. Some are. As our friend Darren tells us, some are pure vanilla, some are pure vanilla extract, some are two-fold, some are regular fold. So there's a lot that goes into vanilla. We're fortunate enough in the class that now we have a Zoom call with Darren at Lockhead. And he answers all the questions. He did a good job, didn't he? Yes, sir. He was very thorough, very patient, and he, he knows a lot. I mean, the man knows vanilla. And this is what his company makes, Lockhead Vanilla. So really, it's personal. And even he said that yesterday. He makes, how many vanillas did he say? Hundreds, right? His company makes hundreds of different vanillas. So, you know, you have to decide what you're going to want. He'll help you. Hey, Mike, could you pop down my uh, intercom for a second? I'm going to take these ice creams out. Oh. Out where? To Christy to load up. Okay. I'll do it. It's just all you it needs. the door for me. All it needs is a cover. Oh no, we're gonna put in some. No, I'm taking this one. <laughs> Boy, walking right out of here with my ice cream. I'm taking this home. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's uh, it definitely tastes Italian. You know, like uh, a cannoli, which is good. Well, you didn't like it, huh? <laughs> uh, listen, I, I guess I'll say this. You're sitting here, we're going to make six or, six or so products today. Ices, ice cream, cream ice, which is sherbet. The whole thing you should take away from this class is how simple this is. It's really simple, right? That's one thing that the class always, after Monday, after we make ice cream for five, six, seven hours, half of them don't even watch anymore because you got it. The machine, you got it. It's a piece of cake. It's, uh, it's basically on off. Making the ice cream, yeah, you'll follow recipes in the beginning, but it won't take you long to experiment and come up with something. I never made grape nuts ice cream. I don't know if it's good or not, but we're going to make it today. I've never made Butterfinger cream ice. We have Butterfinger ice cream at the store, but Butterfinger cream ice, Butterfinger sherbet. Never made that. See what it tastes like. You guys are guinea pigs. If you like it, great. We take it to the next step. If you don't, we may take it there anyway. Uh, what can we do to improve this ice cream? Ooh. A little more sugar, maybe? More sugar. Good, I like your thinking. Mm -hmm. A little less vanilla. Yeah. A less vanilla? <laughs> well, that was an error. Um, <laughs> but I got to tell you, you know, that I opened up the ricotta this morning. Steve was here, and I smelled it, and I smelled nothing. And I gave it to Steve, and he said, I smell nothing. So if you don't add enough vanilla, maybe we added too much, I don't know. Or sugar. Uh, I don't even know why cannolis are so popular. What do they add to cannolis? Ah, what do they add to cannolis to make them so good? Vanilla, sugar. I don't know. I don't think they could add anything else. I think it was, it was, it was a fail of the show. 
Well, well, forget the shell. If you taste the cannoli, yeah, what makes and cannolis are it amazing. Smells vanilla. Vanilla. But usually, you can smell vanilla. On the cannoli. Right. Well, you can smell the vanilla on this. <laughs> so maybe with a little tweaking, this would fly. I mean, I like it. I think it's pretty good. But okay. All right, my turn. Yes. It's Italian ice season, and. If you haven't done Italian ice, or if you haven't thought about it, you really should. It's known by a bunch of different names. Uh, in New York, we call it Italian ice. In, in uh, Philadelphia, I can tell who's from Philadelphia because they refer to it as water ice, which I think is a horrible name, but it sells a lot. Uh, Rhode Island, it's called slush. Um, fancy French restaurant, it's uh, sorbet. If you're in Italy, it's called sorbetto. Uh, in Birmingham, Alabama, it's called Greek ice. And the only reason is, and it's uh, five brothers who left Brooklyn and went to Birmingham. Amazing, I don't know why they'd want to leave Brooklyn. Um, but, uh, and I said, why don't you call it Italian ice? He said, because we're Greek. Why should we call it Italian? So it can be anything you want. They can call it Hawaiian ice, whatever name you like. It is sugar, water, and flavor. You can't get any less expensive. It's tap water. It's uh, sugar from the supermarket. And it's your flavor. And on a hot day, as I mentioned before, ice cream can make you thirsty. In the old days, before I was born, ice cream parlors uh, with a nice fancy bar that you would sit at, a soda bar, they would also hand you a glass of water because the ice made you thirsty. You're right. They used uh, to do that. Yeah, well, no more. Um, so, uh, but Italian ice, it's a seasonal product except here in Florida because we have tourists and so the tourists come down in the winter and they want to pretend it's summer. So they're drinking margaritas, they're going in the water. <laughs> we're, we're, we're wearing two sweaters and they're going in the water. Uh, and they're eating Italian ice. So it's a May to Columbus Day, you know, mid-October uh, selling product. And then you can turn it around and change the name and raise the price and sell it to weddings as fresh fruit sorbet. Traditionally, it was always lemon, cherry, grape, orange, chocolate. Uh, very ethnic problem. You could uh, go into a uh, product, you could go into a neighborhood and no, if it's the Puerto Rican Day Parade that you're going to sell uh, margarita, uh, coconut. If you're going into uh, an Italian neighborhood, it's going to be, it's so lemon ice that if they order a cherry, they say, give me a cherry lemon ice. Um, if you're going into a you know, Presbyterian church like me, uh, we had to form a committee to make the decision of what we're going to eat because we can't make decisions. But it's, it's pretty unique that it is ethnic that way. And that's the way it always was. Uh, it's changed now. Ralph Sice is up in Staten Island. Um, Larry Silvestro came up with an idea one day and he said, why can't we take an, a typical ice cream flavor and turn it into uh, an Italian ice? So he took sugar and water and Oreo cookies. Now he's got Oreo cookie Italian ice. It's fantastic. Chocolate chip uh, Italian ice. Last class, I made uh, mint chocolate chip Italian ice. <laughs> I put too much green in it, it was hideous looking, and I put a little too much mint extract in it, and Christy tasted it and said, well, I won't need mouthwash now for the next six months. <laughs> so I, I tend to make some mistakes. We're going to make two great ices today, and I know they're great because Christy came up with the formulas, not me. But here's a combination that I haven't seen before of orange, pineapple, Italian ice. And I'm going to, just sh I'm going to show you how easy this is to do. It takes longer to freeze because it doesn't have dairy. It has sugar, lots of sugar. So a high sugar content, longer freeze time. Lower sugar content, shorter freeze time. So let me get my ingredients. Um, I've got my two pounds, whoops, I got my two pounds of sugar. Um, and I'm going to use two quarts of orange juice. Uh, there's Christy. She likes the Simply Orange, so I will go with that and the pineapple. And I need uh, two quarts of pineapple juice, so I'll bring this one along too. There's not even any water in this. It's all flavor. Uh, so I'm just gonna mix this up in a bucket. And let's see, I've got the two pounds of sugar. I want two quarts of orange juice. This is One of the people showed 50. up. This is no water. This is 52, so help me with this. One and a half. One and a half. Thank you. Okay. You're sure about that? So that's one. And a 
half. Oh, there's markers on this. How great. Oh, come on. More. I'm getting there. I don't want to go over like the last okay. guy did. Okay. <laughs> the last guy. <laughs> There's a lineup of makers here. <laughs> um, okay, pineapple juice. This is 46 fluid ounces, one quart 14. It's almost uh, 16 ounces a quart, so it's almost two quarts. How much does the recipe call for? Two quarts. So I'm going to use this and a little more. Right. Don't shortchange it. No, definitely not. What's the name of this? Uh, that's a can opener. Okay. <laughs> Orange pineapple. Orange pineapple Italian ice. Okay, this should be good. We can come up with a better name, I think. Yeah. Tropical, right? Yeah. Tropical Ho ice. And you know what you could add to this? Rum. You could add some yes, rum. exactly. Rum. Or yes. you could add some coconut. Rum. <laughs> Pieces of coconut in there. Yeah, that would be good too. Got a bag of coconut? I don't. Uh, well, I do, but it's probably older than me. That, coconut won't go bad. Where is it? On the shelf over there? I'm going to leave it out. I, know. I don't trust I know. it. Cement shoes. My wife also. So I'm going to put in, uh, I've got one quart, and I just need two ounces. You like that? I'm getting like Jeff. I used to measure everything. Um, I'm going to stir that up. If I Look, he's left the gate open. Close Wait it. a minute. Did you add this one? I didn't use it. This is... Uh, you only need two ounces of this? Oh, no, no, no. You're right. I need the whole thing, don't right. I? The whole thing plus two ounces. Right. And a little bit of the other one. Right. Right. I was hoping to get away with not having to open no, this you twice. Went from two to three yeah. When you're making ice cream or ices, just tell all your employees, "I'm busy. I love you. Go away," because you don't want distractions. You'll, you'll make mistakes. Like way too much mint in the mint. <laughs> Ooh, that was that was nasty. That stuff. was something, wasn't what it? What was even worse was the chutzpah. I had to pass it out to everybody. And the color was more green than that lid right there. It in front was of you. unbelievably green. It was green, grainy, and gross. Well, thank you. <laughs> it did go into my hall of shame. Uh, spatula, spatula up top the machine. Up top the machine. Thank you. What he's doing is diluting uh, the sugar into the mixture so we can pour it all in at once. Yes? So if you're experimenting with flavors, what size batch would you suggest using so you don't waste Well, I have, uh, well, I thought about that a long time. So I came up with a way to test create a batch on the countertop and refine it, record it, and know that it's ready. Um, you want me to show you that? Right? <laughs> the minimum you can run in the machine is three and a half quarts of liquid. Below that, there's so much freezing power that it'll start freezing to the wall. So three and a half quarts. But I, I talk to people all the time who say they're going to experiment for the next six months. And, and my attitude is Nike, uh, just do it. Just get into business. You can experiment on the fly. Because if I have to come up with this flavor today and make it perfect, Christy just did this the way I do it. She did it mathematically. Mathematically, this will work. And then we'll go back and taste it and say, well, uh, we'll try adding a little more of this or taking a little of that out. So you're not going to be six months coming up with another flavor. And besides, don't worry, Mike, I'll come right back on. Um, my next flavor is going to be pink champagne uh, lemonade sorbet. And so if I can make this, and I know that it takes two, two, and two, I already have the basic formula to make that one. 
I may just adjust it a little bit. So the idea is if you can make strawberry ice cream, you can make blueberry, raspberry, uh, pistachio nut salad. They're all going to be in the same general formula. Okay, I'm I'll ready give to go. You that formula in a few minutes for every ice and every cream ice. But yours will be using some water too, Jeff, right? Yes. Yeah. Normally I am too. Whoops. Can I see this? I'm going to leave a little out for expediency because we're always on a time crunch. Okay, I'm going to hit the touch screen. It says make ice cream. I want to find Italian ice, uh, homemade, dairy-free, custard, super premium gelato, frozen yogurt. Next, Italian ice, frozen lemonade, sherbet, sorbet, sorbetto, cream ice, manual. There's Italian ice. Start. And now start timing. Okay, that's it. Why did you start timing? Because I want a general idea of how long it's going to take. But also the machine's doing it too. Um, it's got a timer on. I've been 14 seconds. I can always go over and look. Jeff likes to put his, remember, the basic premise that I said Jeff is always wrong. Uh, but then I end up uh, five years later agreeing with him 100%. So it just um, takes time. Um, he likes to use the machine to mix it. For the first five minutes, there's nothing going on but chilling. It's not freezing it into a product yet. So I've got five minutes of mixing the ingredients while I'm still running. Because to me, time is of the essence. I'm going to be here for the next 14 hours making ice cream. I don't want to waste five minutes of that time just kind of standing around letting it mix. I know it's mixing right now. And it's not affecting the flavor. And then at some point in time, it's going to get down to a certain temperature. It's going to pop like that. And now it's a frozen dessert and then we're just gonna take it down a little further. Questions so far? Actually, to, to just clarify what he said, because I was confused too, it's, it's he spent time mixing it here, right? So it's the same difference. Here's where Steve and I differ a little bit, and he probably knows better than I do, because he makes the machines. I add whatever liquid into the machine, then I just pour the sugar into the machine as it's turning. And in my mind, that's the best mixer money can buy. It's, it's turning the sugar into a, whatever the sub, you know, it's dissolving the sugar uh, pretty much instantly. Now, of course, as the maker of the machine, he'll tell you that putting the sugar in the machine, hang on, I'll give you your due, it's Putting heavy. the sugar in the machine <laughs> will create an abrasion situation and wear out the blades. That's right. Now, I got to tell you, it's a question of do you want the blades to last 40 years or 38 years? That's the problem. <laughs> it's more like six or five uh, for these two pieces of plastic. So, yeah, you will cut life off of them. It used to be more critical. Jeff's, in the old machines. Again, Jeff's not wrong. He's just not right. Uh, we used to have a thin, we had a stainless steel blade with a thin plastic line, and that thin plastic line could wear out very quickly if you're dumping sugar in 16 hours a day, seven days a week. These are much larger, they're, they're pushed out by springs, uh, they, these, these straps here are just to hold it in place. Um, but these are going to last you six years, so if you're doing Jeff's method, maybe you knock a year off of that, and they're not very expensive. Now, just so, so we, I hate to interrupt, but just from work. a quick taste, I would add a little sugar. Yeah? You taste it. Tell me what you think. Okay. I didn't burn my taste buds out in college. Well, I would add a little sugar, and it's probably because there's... Um... Maybe, you, maybe you don't want to. That's well, we'll okay. find out. Careful. This is dicey doing this. Yep. See? It's messy. No, I like it the way it is. Okay. Good I don't enough. want to overpower it with sugar. Good enough. But then, see, that's, uh, I used to get up here and ask the question, you know, very <laughs> ego driven, which Jeff says I'm good at. Now, isn't this great? Don't you love it? And I wasn't getting any information back. Now I will ask you, at least on my flavors, not his, what would you do different? 
what's wrong with it, or not what's wrong with it, but how would you improve it? We did that. Yeah, I know, you learned from me. Right. <laughs> um, but that, that gives you good feedback. I get good feedback from this class, and then the next time I do this, uh, I'll keep that in mind. But I know Jeff's ice creams are a lot sweeter than mine are. And that's, that's what makes this whole business. Everybody, as Jeff said, I can give you mathematical formulas all day long, but you're still going to change it to your personal taste, uh, whatever you decide you like. Any questions? <laughs> All Any right. Questions? Everybody's gone silent. Uh, yes. Uh, as a non-food service guy coming into this industry, is this enough equipment for Florida to be a commercial kitchen for ice cream making? Is this uh, sufficient for a commercial kitchen? It depends on your state. California is absolutely brutal. Uh, Maryland is very tough. Uh, I wouldn't even open in San Diego. Uh, but for the most part, the <laughs> health inspector is They're there. They're from to... San Diego back there. Oh, really? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I personally hate San Diego because the first, not for what you think. I got off the plane. You know, I'm going out there on vacation. I've worked the last six months of winter years ago trying to get slimmed down and get in shape. And I walk off the plane, and I immediately realize I'm the ugliest person in San Diego. They are so healthy and so fit that no matter how much you work out, we all look terrible. So that's my impression of San Diego. It is really a great place. Uh, but the health department is just screamingly difficult. Um, so this is an approved room. I did loan it out to a company, a church once, for a period of six months. And uh, we got it certified. So yes, it has washable walls, washable floor. We have floor drains, which you don't need. Um, everything in here uh, meets code, but you don't know until you talk to them. But what I suggest, it's a very good point. When you go to the health department, before you spend any money with me or anyone else, uh, go in with a notebook, keep a diary, and, and we'll call him Phil, Phil the inspector. Phil the inspector is 23 years old, and has enough, he's got a big book of rules and regs and enough authority to keep you out of business. So Phil says, I want dairy tile walls. Write it down. I want a dairy tile floor. That's like a million dollars a square inch. You write that down. I want um, a, a $3,000 grease trap. Well, okay, we write that down. And then you call someone like me or someone else in the industry, and if they're any good, they'll tell you, well, what's on the floor now? Concrete. Okay. Go back to Phil and say, I know you said at the last meeting you want a dairy tile floor. Can I paint this floor with uh, Rust-Oleum two-stage epoxy like old people do here in Florida? They paint their garages bright colors. And um, that seals it with the paint, and then the epoxy keeps it uh, waterproof so uh, it's easy to wash. That's $87 as opposed to thousands. And Phil says, yeah, okay, that's fine. Puts it down. Hey, you know, you said that you wanted me to have a, a $30,000 grease trap like McDonald's, but I'm not selling hamburgers and I'm not deep French, French fries and all that. I'm making sugar water, no dairy. And if I'm sending dairy down the drain, I'm losing money because that's what I sell is dairy. So how about a $300 grease trap? I used to say fight it, but it, it never worked. So, okay, he says, yeah, I can go with the $300 grease trap. And now... You go ahead, you do all that, and you kept your diary, and then Phil's boss comes in at the day before the opening to do the final inspection. And he knows the rules and regs because he taught Phil. And he looks and says, what's with this you know, red floor? Uh, Phil approved it on uh, April 17th of this year. Oh, well, okay. If Phil approved it, I taught Phil, therefore I have to say it's okay, and it sails through. I mean, the good old days of giving them 20 bucks and th or throwing them in the dumpster, like my father used to say, uh, are gone. I, I challenged him on that in 1977. I, he said, he literally said to, about the fire inspector, uh, give him 20 bucks or toss him in the dumpster. I said, Dad, this is modern times. You can't do that anymore. He said, fine, give him 50 bucks. <laughs> you, know, you can't do that anymore. So you got to work with them, and they're going to be with you forever. Uh, but it doesn't mean you can't strike a compromise. In, in New York City, if you want to open up an ice cream parlor, I, I joke, they're going to come get me, uh, that they have two inspectors and they never leave their office uh, unless someone dies at McDonald's. You know, right there on the spot from food poisoning and the French fries are sitting next to them. It's the only way they're going to leave their office. 
But you walk in and want to open an ice cream parlor, you'll be three years going through environmental surveys and impact studies and, and the structural strength of the ceiling. I don't know that we're making ice cream on the ceiling. So find a way to work with them and uh, find their rules and regulations and then ask someone in the industry, uh, do you have an alternative? And you'll find alternatives. Oh, sure. Contractors are great. Um, contractors will tell you, do you want this uh, done strictly by the code or do, do you want it done great and at a reasonable price? Well, I'll take great and a reasonable price any time. Uh, so, yeah, the contractor is helpful. Really? She but went into all you this? still need, uh, I do have some, you know, some towns are going to ask for an architectural drawing. Well, you can have a great architect, but he's, if he's never done an ice cream parlor, he doesn't know that you can't put that sink right next to this batch freezer because the health department says dirty water from the sink could splash into the batch freezer. Uh, so uh, call up, again, someone in the industry, whether it's Capigiani, Electrofreeze, uh, Taylor, Stolting, or me, call someone up and see if they can't uh, help you with that, uh, with the drawings. He, they can call your architect or your builder and say, uh, this is what we'd like to do. So that's helpful. Um, so you know, have everything lined up uh, before you go before the board uh, and be willing to uh, make concessions, so minor ones. You know, don't, don't, be, don't be a New Yorker. Don't dig in <laughs> like we do. Anybody else? Let me see how this is coming. I've been on Norga. It's getting there. I'll show you what it looks like. Um, oh, all the cameras are here now. They used to be crosswise. That's looking very good. I'm going to let it go. I don't know if you can see it, but it, it, it peaked the way Jeff talked about. Uh, but I'm going to let it go uh, a little bit longer because I, like, I just like to pull it stiffer. Now remember, Jeff said it needed more sugar, so that's one thing I'm going to be looking for is the reaction. Uh, I, I don't have a problem with more sugar. Sometimes when you call up and you say, my strawberry Italian ice has got four bags of strawberries and four 11-ounce bags, but it's still weak. Well, sometimes uh, strawberries are a weak flavor to begin with. Um, and sometimes adding more strawberries won't help it, but adding a little more sugar will make the flavor enhance. Uh, it will, you know, help it pop. So it's not always the flavor. It might be uh, changing the, the mixture a bit. And, and this is costing us um, this two and a half gallon tub. The way we made this is going to cost us about nine dollars for the uh, three three gallon tub. Excuse me, for a three gallon tub, nine dollars. There's ninety. 96 portions in a tub, let's call it 90 just to play safe. So if anybody's good with math, what's 90 times 250? Uh, that's a heck of a lot of money, minus $9. This is the, the most profitable thing that you can possibly make. And it's great for putting up in pints, freezing it solid. So if you're doing a, um, a fair or a festival or, excuse me, uh, or a weekend, um, uh, what do you call it, um, farmer's market, Maybe you sell the ice as they're coming in and you have limited flavors. And then um, when they're leaving, now you've got pints frozen to 10 below. I'm gonna put it in this. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, it looks nice. Frozen to 10 below um, so that they can take it home. I'm gonna turn off the refrigeration switch and watch how fast this comes out. And so you're gonna sell them both ways. You're gonna sell them while they're in there and as they're leaving and can take it home. Oops, I didn't attach that right. Hey Jeff, I need some help. What happened? The I shelf. didn't attach the, sh the can thing right. Okay, give me this, you do the shelf. No, you gotta get under here. Right. Okay. Hey. Gotta get what? Get <laughs> under here. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Why don't you close the gate? I got all this on the loose. Huh? We'll finish. Okay, I got you. I read you. 
<laughs> this we don't need. How long do I have to do this? Until I take it. <laughs> Thank you. Um. Now, see, this is a beautiful thing about doing a live show. Anything that can okay. go wrong <laughs> will go wrong. <laughs> oh. We never said we were professionals. We're not called ice cream professionals. We are amateurs having a lot of fun. Well, notice I was over here when that... Look at the mess you made. <laughs> See. Put the shelf back on. I, I will. i got to scoop it out first. Oh, I'll I, do that. I want to hear what people think of it. I'll do that. Let me get you a scoop. <laughs> yeah, he always leaves the floorboard to me. Right. It's my fault now. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Clean that up. I am. Sir, yes, sir. This is why you don't want to make ice cream out in front of the public. Though there was a franchise in San Francisco, we did 475 stores in the 70s, 80s, and 90s called Swenson's. Earl Swenson came up with an idea called Swenson's See Us Freeze. And as you walk around my building, you'll see that this, I designed this after Earl Swenson. I have picture windows looking into all our offices because it's fun to see what's going on instead of being closed in. And uh, Earl had a picture window into his ice cream room. So back where Mike is, that's my sound room. Uh, that would be an ice cream room with a big picture window. And on Friday night, Saturday night, and Sunday night, old man Swenson, as I called him, um, would come, would make, it's a terrible time to make anything. Saturday night, all hands on deck, scooping, we're busy. Well, Swenson would make ice cream Saturday night at 7 o'clock. Everybody knew that. And then old man Swenson would come out with a tub while people were waiting in line and give out free ice cream because he knew he was now providing not only a great ice cream but entertainment. Hey, we can go to Swenson uh, Saturday night. It'll only cost us an ice cream cone to entertain the kids. And uh, they're coming out with the latest flavor. Awful time to make ice cream. But very, very successful uh, because... It was better than going to Dairy Queen or uh, McDonald's or anything like that because you could see how it was made. So that's why you'll see all these uh, picture windows around in here is in, in tribute to uh, Earl Swenson. And it, for, it makes for great morale. I said every, early on that everybody's cross-trained uh, for different jobs here because it makes it more interesting. Um, but uh, it was, it's, and so the windows allow you to see everything that's going on. Any questions? Okay. Let me know. Tell me what you think. You know on a hot day, that's going to be incredibly refreshing. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? You know that we wound up on the floor. Adding more people here. You will sell this a four ounce cup? <laughs> uh, yes. Um, I'll show you what I use. Let me wash my hands. We use in New York what's called a squeeze cup. And a squeeze cup has a real name. It's called a pleated, like a lady's dress, pleated water cup. And uh, the beauty of it is it costs next to nothing. And um, the kids, you, you, it's a three and a half ounce cup. Let me get some, and uh, you can put four ounces into it, and that's my regular size. And uh, you can price what the market will bear. I mean, people don't know the difference in their mind between ice cream and ices, so you can charge what you want. A little more difficult in New York because there's so much competition. It's made by Solo. Uh, Christy Brown, our vice president, started her career at Solo, running production lines, uh, running the machinery, keeping them running. Um, and this is called uh, their number 450, 450 Solo uh, Pleated Water Cup, otherwise known as a squeeze cup to us Italian ice people. And I'm going to show you how it works. I want this, thanks. Let me just borrow that. Steve, what's the RPMs that the ice is running at? Uh, actually, it's the same as homemade. 
If I want to uh, cut some of the air out for sorbet, there isn't much air in Italian ice anyway, because Italian ice, let me just show you this first. That's the pleated water cup. Normally it would be crowned over if I did it right, and you eat it like that and squeeze it from the bottom. That's good. That's really good. And that covers three and a half ounces of that. When you crown it over, it's four ounces. Thanks to McDonald's, it's a quarter pound. <laughs> it's huge, it's a quarter pound. <laughs> I feel uh, like you don't see those anymore. Like mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of the um, Italian ice places I've been to here, like in New York, you'll you'll get that. Yeah. But um, here it's in a, like a clear plastic cup and oil or, or a styrofoam cup, and it's usually. There's no wrong way. Yeah. But this is a very simple and inexpensive way. You could buy a case of these, five thousand for about thirty-five dollars, and it's made in the USA, so they're readily available. Mm -hmm. And they don't have much other market uh, for this cup because who's got a water cooler except us? You know, they don't really exist. How much does that cost that would you charge for that little four ounce? Whatever the market would bear. Um, I had a guy who had a beat up old truck. He came in one time just before Easter and he was pretty bold. He said, uh, I have no money. Can I borrow your room? To make Italian ices, I'll fill up my truck and then I'll come back and pay you. And he was going around to lower income neighborhoods and he was selling for a dollar. Uh, then one day he gets into the Florida Fair, which is in Tampa. It's five, five days. And you know fairs and festivals, Ferris wheels, rides, the whole works, and they charge a fortune for food, uh, like a movie theater. So he was so smart, he looked at Coke and Pepsi. And he said, you know what, they're so big, they must have a team of 10 or 12 people who do nothing more than sit around and say, at the Belgian uh, Bratwurst Festival, we can get uh, $6 for this, this uh, regular size Coke. And, and over here uh, at the New York State Fair, we can get uh, $5 for it. He said, they've done all the work. I'm going to charge exactly what they charge for a small Coke or Pepsi. And he said, I'm a better product. And he did. And so for five days, he sold for $5. Made an absolute fortune. Here's where his genius comes in. He came from lowly roots. Not a lot of money. No money. He's driving home after five days of selling for $5. He's all puffed up. My product is worth five bucks. You know, the ego just kills you. And he goes by one of his little parks that he normally stops at. And the kids come running over. And one kid goes, hey, mister, how much for an ice? And he goes, Five bucks, kid. Kid reaches into his pocket and says, I've got 43 cents. And he says, let's see, this cost me 10 cents, 43 cents. I'm going to make a, a 33 cent profit. Okay, kid, it's yours for 33 cents. So he was able to, excuse the pun, change on a dime his pricing from $5 down to 43 cents because that was what the market would bear. And you don't know what the market will bear until you push it. And with the millennials, all bets are off. All they care about is the highest quality they can get. I don't care what it costs. I, I, whether it's a good example or not, uh, my youngest son, uh, he, he'll spend, he, he'll spend uh, three days going in and out of Sherry Lehman in Manhattan, a very fancy liquor store. He'll buy a $50 bottle of wine for he and his wife for the weekend. I'm going, are you kidding me? When I was... Back when I was your age, we were buying three, three uh, big boxes of Boone's Farm for, uh, for $20. And he just looks at me and goes, Dad, you're a pig. <laughs> I couldn't argue with him. But they are a wonderful market because they don't care that a pint costs 9 or $10. It's what they want. It's the best quality. And they're going to buy two of them. So if you sold this from a push cart, uh, at a fair or a festival, and they're going in, and then you had a chest freezer nearby hooked up to a little Honda generator. They're, they're great, they're quiet, and you have pints down to 10 below, rock solid. They'll always buy two. I mean, I can't come home and say, hey, honey, I bought a, a, a mint chip Italian ice for myself. Well, what'd you get me? Oh, uh, nothing. You know, they're always going to buy two. There's your $20. And how, well, how was it? Or what would you, what would you do different? It's not my ice, it's hers, Christy. So we can yeah, say whatever we want. Maybe the pineapple juice a little bit? Just yeah, little that's what I thought. Case, yeah. I thought the pineapple was a little overwhelming. That's good. Anybody, anything else? Yes, sir. 
now to for a, a sorbet, would you add more sugar? No, a sorbet is exactly the same thing. Um, let me show you the difference between an Italian ice and a sorbet. <laughs> yeah, you've seen this. <laughs> okay. That's lemon Italian ice. That's lemon sorbet. Same, uh, seven pounds of sugar, 14 quarts of water, two quarts of lemon juice, only this is sold on the street corner and this is sold in La Penetiere restaurant. And the price is jacked up. It's the same thing, it's just a different name. And you're not gonna find, um, I don't know, you're not gonna find cherry ice in, in a restaurant. You're gonna find um, Mount Rainier cherries, uh, sorbet. You know, same stuff, it's still cherry, but uh, just, you know, upscale. Exact same product. Yes? Uh, can you make further desserts with Pepsi or Coke? Yes. Uh, there is a wonderful business, uh, Howdy Homemade. Um, he is in Texas. He franchises. And he spe his, his specialty is uh, working uh, with children with disabilities, adults with disabilities, not children. And uh, that's his whole genesis of his business is everybody in his store has some kind of uh, learning disability. And he teaches them how to make the ice cream, how to serve it, how to sell it. He's becoming very famous. And he has a, a contract with Dr. Pepper, which is located in his town, uh, to use their product to make uh, Italian ice. And they sell it at all the big events and at, at one of the, whatever stadium is down there. Bush Stadium maybe, I don't know. Uh, so yeah, you can. It is going to lose, uh, it's going to beat out most of the fizz, but not all of it. Uh, but for the most part, you're getting the flavor that you want. 7-Eleven uh, came out, they copied our slush machine down the road many years, this is from the early 60s, and they pressurized it. They injected air into the sugar water. Um, and that's, that's a whole different product. I don't, you don't even see it anymore, because it wasn't any good. But it was a fad. Fads come and go. Ices. An icy is usually a slush. Yes. Yeah. Ices. They're still popular. Yeah, we call. Yeah, sure they are. Uh, at Seven Eleven, we call it a slush. Right. And we made millions of slush machines, uh, but we got out of that market. Well, pretty much same, probably as an icy machine. Yeah. Well, yeah, we we made the first one. Right. Um, back in 1960, and went from there. Sold thousands, thousands of them. Uh, somebody asked about, the, you asked over there about the air content of uh, Italian ice, uh, or can you slow it down to have less air? <clears throat> Dairy is a fat cell. It takes on air. So uh, if you take uh, a bowl and you put heavy cream into it and you stir it with a whisk, it's going to remain heavy cream. If you take an electric mixer, Jeff uses a, a Black & Decker drill and a paint stirrer which works very well, and sticks it in, and it's at high speed rotation, boom, whipped cream. That is the definition of air content or overrun. It's either in its raw state, just a liquid, or you've whipped it up so much it's got air in it. And we control the air up and down. Now you get to sugar water products or dairy-free, uh, which I use coconut or um, oat. And uh, they don't have any dairy in them, so there are no fat cells to expand. Um, so, but water does expand a little bit. If you have a nice wood Chris Craft from the 50s, and you're up on Lake Michigan, and you leave it in the water over the wintertime, that boat is going to be crushed, because water expands 17%, or 34% overrun uh, would be an overrun term. It expands 34% overrun, that wood boat just gets crushed by the expansion of water. You know, you always hear about people up there, they have, you know, uh, ramps going out to their boats and they didn't take them in in the winter and they're just destroyed. So you will get expansion of water. We get a little bit more from the machine, uh, but maybe not even 10% uh, because we're whipping it. But for the most part, without fat, fat cells, you can't have expansion. But even, I'm talking to the wrong crowd. Uh, they got to be our age. We used to use something called ice cube trays. And you took an ice cube tray and you filled it up and if you made a mistake, you filled it up right to the top line and then you put it in the freezer. And when you came back tomorrow, all those little ice cubes were crowned over 
because the freezing process expanded the water. But otherwise, overrun <laughs> or air content doesn't, is not applicable really to uh, uh, those kind of frozen so desserts. So the simple answer? No. So the RPMs doesn't matter with Italian ice, Correct. it's just how fast it's going to freeze it? Not really. I do have a different setting on the machine because people want to be able to just make it easy and say, I want to do, they want to teach the employee, just go to Italian ice. To ex the old way was buttons and you put in 234 and to explain to a, an employee uh, <clears throat> that I want you to run it the same as ice cream, they're confused. Yeah. So we just say Italian ice. Yeah. The difference between water ice and cream ice is what? Air? Cream. cream. That's going to be Jeff. It's cream. That, that's cream. A, a cream. little bit of cream, cream. in there. Not a lot. So the consistency would be? Smoother, smoother and creamier. Smoother. Okay. And a little more airy. And another question. About this machine that you that you just did that with, that was the three. With the shelf that fell off? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> that machine can produce on one run one of these tubs? No. Uh, half, of half of a tub. So if you're making cherry ice. Uh, a gallon and a half. Yeah, you're going to make a gallon and a half. Let me get one. So you put this under the machine, and it's going to fill it up halfway with cherry ice. Then you put it in the freezer. You reload the machine with cherry ice again. And now you take that out of the freezer. It's only been 13 minutes. Nothing has happened to that product whatsoever. Right. So you're going to then take and put it under there and fill it up the full way. So every on Italian ice... Uh, you'd have, theoretically, you'd have in 16 minutes a full tub with ice cream and uh, a full tub in under 30 minutes with Italian so ice. So you would use these tubs in the dipping cabinets? Uh, if you want, I, I also like these. Uh, this comes from a company called Gelato, G-E-L-A-T-O, gelatosupply.com. Gelatosupply.com. And if you use the passcode, password, uh, or coupon code, Emory Thompson, my name, Emory Thompson in block letters, you'll get 10% off. Um, this is a liner uh, for, here, here we go. This is a gelato pan. That's probably about 100 bucks of stainless steel. This is a gelato pan liner, and it's, it's just, you know, practically pennies. I like to, I don't use this, I use these. I can get two, three, four uses out of this. It's great for wholesale. But what I really like about it is uh, when you go to scoop ice cream, um, the proper way to scoop ice cream to preserve the air is in a semi-circular motion like this. You go home tonight, you know, pick up your pen or whatever, and in the air, just go like this, the approved way of scooping ice cream. You're rolling it into the scoop to preserve the air. Your wrist, your wrist will hurt so bad, you'll be cursing the day you heard my name. And your employees won't do it. As soon as you leave, no way. They're not going to scoop like this. They're going to go front to back. All the strength is in your bicep. And so you're going like that. So to take it to an extreme, here's this wonderful pan. And I'm going like this. And I've got all a lot of strength. That's a very easy scooping maneuver. Uh, the machine is going to fill exactly one of these plus uh, a bit more. We get, this is, I think, six quarts. We get about... Uh, seven quarts out of the machine. Uh, so these are handy. The other thing I like about it for wholesale is restaurateurs uh, don't have the space they used to. The, the, there's an old expression, and then I'll shut up. Uh, the money's made at the tables, not the kitchen. So what's happened in the last few years is rents went way up, and the restaurateur says, I need more tables. So where am I gonna get more tables? I can't get another uh, restaurant, or I can't buy the store next door. So he backs up this way, adds six more tables, and says to the executive chef, I'm sorry, I just shrunk your kitchen. Honey, I shrunk the kitchen. So we used to sell haagen My customer sells in three-gallon tubs, and they take up a lot of space in the kitchen. And they, haagen delivers uh, 10 tubs once every two weeks. So the chef's got the problem. Where am I going to put them? You come in, and in, this, in just a little over the space of a tub, I have four flavors, as opposed to one tub, one mint chip, I now have four different flavors. So I'm giving the executive chef more flavors and less space in his freezer. And that means a lot. They're going to buy from you instead of Haagen-Dazs. And these are just simple and fun. Yeah? 
Do those have lids that yes. go on them? Yes. Yeah. You can buy a plastic lid that goes on it. Um, this is a faded one, but it's just an inexpensive plastic lid. Gelatosupply.com. I have no association with them other than I know uh, Jim Hall, the owner, and good people. And they what would you sell the ice cream on it? They could also get the metal uh, shelf. For yes, this. I showed them that oh, too. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. What would be the price going for that for nice for uh, Tyler Nice to be sold? I have no idea. I don't buy anything. Okay. I I'm the president. They don't let me buy anything. <laughs> they don't let me touch prices. Yes. So can you use those for ice cream? Like if I'm doing craft shows? That's Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And then when someone at Christmas wants a specialty flavor, uh, they want Grand Marnier liqueur ice cream. Great formula. It's on my website. Very expensive to make. You charge them 60 bucks for just one of these. Well, I mean, at a craft show, if I'm doing craft shows so I can take it out of the freezer and serve it if there's a line or something like that instead of using a tub. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's easier. It's a smaller amount. It's easier to work with. And it's got this motion as opposed to this motion. Yeah. I got to stop so that we can continue. Well, that's an interesting way to put it. I have to stop so we can continue. <laughs> yeah. Steve, what's yeah, the serving there. temperature of Italian ice? If you make it my way, the serving temperature is 16 degrees Fahrenheit. If you use an excellent product, I Rice Company, it's more around 8 or 10, uh, the way it's put together. My, mine are sugar water and uh, fresh frozen fruit. Uh, so basically 16, and I will show you, it's in my... I'll get it after lunch, a little device how we can take that plain old uh, serving cabinet, which is set at you know, five or ten below, and turn it into an Italian ice cabinet at 16 above. It's really cool. So does the iRice stuff just have like a stabilizer in it that allows it? Or yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and the best mango on earth. No, no question about it. And other flavors. If you want to do, um, uh, say, root beer, they've got a root beer. Uh, if, if I'm in an Italian neighborhood or coming from an Italian neighborhood, there's only one way on earth I'm making lemon ice. Sugar, water, flavor, and the zest of six lemons. That's the real hidden secret uh, little, uh, to throw in there. They do not, I don't care what an executive chef says, they do nothing for the flavor, but it looks really cool to have a pure white product with little specks of lemon in it. I used to have a guy, if he, had if he had artificial water, that's what he would use. He was so cheap. Uh, but he would take six lemons and cut them into big pieces, throw them in the machine. The, the servers would scoop it, and there is this all chemical, Dow Chemical would be thrilled with it, product with uh, a little piece of lemon sticking out of it, and everybody goes, oh, man, that's really fresh. It was horrible, but it was good marketing. So the little specks, they don't add flavor, uh, but it helps. Jeff. Steve, do you really make ice smell this? You really make ice cream out of that? Oh, yeah. Trust me. Okay. Jeff's not made this one before. This is a huge flavor in, uh, in uh, Boston. A, no, it's not. Did you have a question? Yeah, I have a question. So, according to this measurement, it comes out at one and a half gallon as the end product? Yes. Yeah. Uh, two and a half gallon? Two, four. It ended up coming out about four and a half. And it's going to give. Well, don't forget yeah. what was on the floor. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I re my back remembers it. Uh, it's going to give you uh, approximately seven quarts. So four uh, plus three, uh, um, a gallon and three quarters out of the machine. Yeah. See, when and then I'll show you. When we're using dairy blend, it comes in bags, so it's an exact measurement. Uh, but when I'm dealing with sugar water, I can play with it. I can up the amount of water and sugar and flavor to be a bigger batch going in, knowing it's going to take me five minutes longer to freeze, but I actually, in the long run, saved time. So sugar water you can play with. Dairy, we just want to get uh, four batches out of that bag for the CB350. Okay. 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 You can have your glassware. Oh, thank you. Uh, so Steve asked me to make uh, grape nuts ice cream. So we'll give it a shot. I just checked the ingredients. Boy, this sure lends itself to a nice sweet creamy dessert. The ingredients are whole grain wheat, flour, malted barley flour, salt, and yeast. You don't have to make it if you don't want. Boy, that'll make some ice cream, won't it? You don't have to make it if you don't no, want. No, I'll make it. Did I you bring honey? A, I brought accoutrements, yes dear. <laughs> Uh, knowing that grape nuts was on the menu today, I brought some honey and some raisins. Do you want my recipe? 
No. Okay. No, we're going to, uh, you wanted to know how we come up with a recipe on the table so we don't have to experiment in our machines. If you have a six quart machine, sure you can experiment, but why bother? Better to know before you create the ice cream, right? So we'll do that now. Now I'm going to, uh, these are little tiny uh, orbs in here. Um, and trust me, they smell awful. This is, has any, does anybody eat grape nut cereal? You do? What do you do to make it good? Sugar. Sugar. Ah, okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to, uh, I'm going to reduce the size of these a little more than what they already are to get more of the flavor. But then it won't be grape nuts. No, I have all those. Okay. Hey. It's got to be crunchy. We used to give this to our friends after they had their uh, uh, wisdom teeth taken out. It was always worth a good laugh. Okay. Uh, all right, we'll try it, but this isn't really going to work. But I'll show you how I do a, a, a formula on the bench so that we know what the proportions are in the machine. All right? I generally start with a one-quart container. Uh, this one has springs in it, not conducive to the ice cream. <laughs> Thanks. Who did I oh, got that? it. Okay, good. <laughs> At least someone did. Uh, let's see. We don't have any more quart containers. So we'll use... Uh, we had one. Oh, it's in the freezer. Okay. I'm going to put these oh, right springs... Right right uh, okay, we'll rinse that out. I just wanted to get all this out because I'm not going to clean the machine between these two flavors. Uh, the way I figure it, any flavor we can add to that stuff is a bonus. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. Well, maybe it'll be terrific. Did you sell your Disney yet? It's down $4 this morning. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let's, let's take this and dump it. All right, we need a uh, secretary for this one, somebody who's going to do the note-taking. He volunteered you. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> okay, so what we're going to start with is eight ounces of mix. Uh, I use a one-quart container, and I put eight ounces of mix in there. We've never done this before. No. You want me to get you the formula? No. No, I'm going to create the formula. Okay, but I did it uh, 15 years ago. And who knows if it was right? <laughs> eight ounces. Well, this is just a learning experience. So we'll take eight ounces of cream. You got that, secretary? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, eight ounces in a quart container. And everything will be based on this. You, you'll see the picture in a minute. Now we have to know how much of the primary flavor to add. The pri I don't know if you'd call this the primary flavor or not. Uh, <laughs> sell, sell. <laughs> I did that last night. All right, so we'll add. We have to measure this as well, so I'll tell you what. Well, we don't know about that. And I know this is liquid measure, and we're measuring solids, but it's all going to be just proportions that we need. So let's add one cup. One cup of grain. <laughs> into here. And now we're going to mix it up. Does this stuff dissolve? It doesn't, does it? No. no so what's gonna, the point of making this? It's crunchy. 
Did you get the raisins? Yeah, I have raisins. Okay. Raisins do make it taste better. Yeah. Well, of course. This is going to be awful. No, it isn't. You're going to use more than that, aren't you? More what? More gray nuts. Well, this is, all right, go back to your thing. <laughs> so right now, what we're creating looks to me to be adobe. <laughs> it's got to have some taste. But I suspect sugar is going to come into play here, right? Right? Steve, you have any brown sugar? Uh, no. <laughs> I don't. Who will tell you the conditions I got to work on, do you know? I, th I thought you were giving me code. Adobe is down $15 this morning. You, have, um, you don't have any brown sugar? I don't. I, How about by the, net, by the Hershey syrup? Geez. Is that brown sugar in the bag? Up no, top? that's, that's uh, for top. cocoa. Hershey's cocoa, golden raisins. Right in the bag behind that. What's Classic, that? Classic uh, cinnamon powder. Brown sugar's up top to the left. Right? Ah, there we go, in the box, Domino's. Okay. Okay. There you go. Uh, it just, uh, I would rather add brown sugar to this than white sugar. Just a hunch. <laughs> See, now normally what you do is you would taste it and see if it's good. If it's good the way it is, you know what the proportions are to increase it before you add it to the machine. Okay, now we know what you're doing. Those of us who didn't take your class don't know this. This is a good trick. Well, it's, it's common sense. So now, we'll taste it. <laughs> I, I, this, is, this is unbelievable. Who came up with this? People in Boston. How, what's, what, I don't know, I have to ask this, um, but okay. You want me to uh, give you the recipe? What? You want me to give you the recipe? Absolutely not. <laughs> so uh, let's presume that we're okay here, okay? So now what we have to do is figure out what we're going to put in here. Again? <laughs> I have to take it. Oh, it's you. Anthony? Hey, Jeffrey? Yes. Hey, this is Pete at Soundcrafters. Okay, speak Pardon fast. Me? Pardon me? Speak fast, tomorrow at noon, right? Correct. That's what you call for? I was just calling to confirm it. Oh, okay, see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. <laughs> the guy called me, what, two hours ago? And he told me tomorrow at noon, right? We wrote it down? No, sometimes it was a Okay, so, so to do That's that... We're going to make it into five quarts, right? Five quarts of mix in this machine. So five quarts, and we have eight ounces. Eight ounces is one quarter of a quart, correct? <laughs> eight ounces is a quarter, so to get five quarts, how many ounces do we need? 20. 20, correct. We need 20 ounces of this stuff. <laughs> uh, and this stuff we have, let's see. We have, this is 29 ounces in here. And this is another 20 ounces. Actually, this size box would do, right? If we're looking at 20 ounces. So, one, yeah. what? Yeah, one to one. The, what? You said one to one, right? right. So ounces, eight ounces? Well, we have, uh, how many ounces did we put in here? Eight ounces. Yeah. And we need four times that. Yeah. So that means we need 16. 32 ounces, right? Eight times four. Whew. And then we need that times five. So we, we don't have that much. And I don't think you need that much. So this, this formula isn't going to work because this stuff doesn't dissolve. What you need to have is, do you get the, how we do this? You need to have something that dissolves. Let's say you're making, um, uh, uh, pick a flavor. Strawberry. Strawberry ice cream. So whatever your basis is for strawberry, whether it's strawberry syrup, whether it's frozen strawberries that you puree, whatever that is, you, have, you start with eight ounces of mix, and then you add that strawberry 
stirring, tasting, stirring, tasting until you're satisfied with the flavor. Once you're satisfied with the flavor, then it's a simple matter of multiplication. You multiply the liquid times four to give you one quart, and then I would do it times 10 to give me the, this machine. And then the same with the strawberries. If you used two ounces of strawberries that gave you the good flavor, then you would multiply two ounces of strawberries times eight is 16 ounces times 10 is 160 ounces. Knowing how many ounces there are in a gallon, how many ounces in a gallon? 128. So pretty much a gallon of strawberry, if that's the method that you're using. If you're using frozen strawberries and you puree them, then you would increase it that fold. Does this stuff ever dissolve when you, you know, you eat the cereal too fast, right? You'd have to let it sit a long time. Overnight, time. Overnight? Nobody <laughs> does that. Oh, I better prepare my breakfast and leave it outside here. Overnight oats. <laughs> so this is, uh... all right, I'm going to add some sugar to it and some raisins and some honey. In which case, we really don't need the grape nuts at all. <laughs> we can just have sugar, honey, and raisin ice cream, which would be good. But since he's hell-bent on this stuff, we'll do it. So first, let's add... Could add some chips to it. All right, so first we'll add this, which is how many quarts? Thank you. Need a bathroom? Okay, no. five quarts of this stuff. Hey, it's going to be great. Oh, it'll be terrific. How much uh, grape nuts are you putting in? Um, I don't know. We'll have to uh, play that by ear. How much do you think we ought to add? Um, a whole bag. Uh, it's a 12 quart whole bag. Well, there are two bags. There's yeah, a you don't regular need size bags. and family size. I think I'd put in the regular size. Okay, that's what we'll do then. That's what it actually, right? Okay, let's start it up. You know, we did make uh, ice cream out of Cinnamon Toast Crunch, and it was real good. And somebody suggested that we make ice cream out of Graham, what, Honey, gra honey Grahams? Mm-hmm. Golden Grahams. Golden Grahams, right, Golden Grahams. Uh, was that you? Him. Uh, he suggested that we make it out of that, but I was too lazy to go to the supermarket last night. And when I spoke to Steve on the phone, he said, hey, we have grape nuts. <laughs> And Christy just brought them in because it's her daughter's favorite flavor. Okay, well, there you go. Let's add some grape nuts. You have to keep an open mind in ice cream. Oh, I do. And now I want to add some sugar. <laughs> oh, hard as hell. Yes. Quick question about the 350? Of course. So on the website it says, I think it says something about only a 20 amp breaker? That's correct. So don't, you cannot plug it in if it's a double 40 amp? No. Okay. It would have no protection whatsoever. Uh, you, we will we'll send you, if you order a machine, we're going to send you about three letters uh, in increasing threat, saying that you must use a, a licensed electrician and the final letter will say, if you don't use a licensed electrician and something goes wrong with the machine, we're going to ask for a copy of the receipt that you use a licensed electrician. It is just amazing, and it happens so many times, that someone will buy a $13,000 machine, a $30,000 machine. That's a lot of money in my book. And then they hire their Uncle Louie, who once changed a light switch, or worse, uh, the contractor. Someone mentioned the contractor before. They're very good people, but they're not a licensed electrician. And they come in with their own preconceived notions. Uncle Louie doesn't know what he's doing. He's just saying, oh, sure, the, the clothes dryer worked here, so we might as well use the clothes dryer plug. 
And if it isn't pro the proper size and the proper wire, the wires uh, have to be thick enough to run this machine. And a clothes dryer uh, doesn't run on a very thick wire. Uh, it's got to be done to code uh, because if your store burns down, the first thing you'll find out, as uh, a big franchise that we work with uh, found out, your insurance won't cover you. They come in and they look at everything and they see that the Emory Thompson didn't cause it. It was the blender, the home blender that you bought, the wearing home blender that you bought for home use uh, that burned down the store, uh, even though it was turned off. And they'll go through everything not to make that claim. So it's for your own good. So it's got to be, and what I do with people, because I'm always trying to save you money, without getting all electrical, the thicker the wire, the, the thicker the power can go through, <clears throat> the lower the number. So a 14 wire is your normal extension cord. Um, a 10 wire is about the strongest in your house. Uh, these bigger machines run on eight wire. So right now, my store is wide open. I'm getting ready to you know, decorate. I'm running the line for the CB350. It takes a number 10 wire or whatever code says. And I tell you, for 70 bucks more, have the electrician go out and buy the heavier number eight wire. Not because it's safer now, but I know that in a few years, you're gonna be doing so much business, you're gonna need a 24. And so instead of ripping up the walls for $1,000 to run the wire, you'll already have it there. It'll already be a number eight, and all you do is just change the breaker, and, and there you go. So for 60 bucks, I'm saving you 1,000 uh, by running the electric properly. But it's, it's critical that it be done on anything in your store. You can't just say, so you can run hey, it'll go right. Basically, you're saying eight wire. Yeah, because I could run it on six or four, because all that's going to go through to it is at the breaker box, the 40 amp breaker, the 20 amp breaker. Uh, yeah, it's extremely efficient. 20 amps is really low. A dedicated, a dedicated plug for the machine. Yes, uh, dedicated means that you're not plugging a toaster into it or a blender or anything else. Now the little CB200 over there, that runs on 115 volt, and that'll run in your kitchen. Uh, but maybe not in your bedroom. Your bedroom has a couple of lights and a TV. Uh, so the wire size, is, uh, the, the breakers are very low grade. In your kitchen, we know you're gonna run the toaster, uh, the electric oven, and the blender at the same time. So they are still 110, but they have a heavier line to them. So the littlest machine can run uh, pretty much anywhere in the house that's got a heavier line, like a kitchen. You really wouldn't wanna make ice cream in your bedroom anyway. It's messy. But the 350 needs a 220, right? 350 needs a 220. Yep. Because the motors and compressors are bigger. The bigger the machine, the bigger the motors and compressors. Yes. So you've got two breaker boxes back there. I've seen on all of your videos. And I'm assuming you've got the four machines going through those two boxes. Do we just need a regular 220 volt plug on the wall? Or do we need a breaker box like that? No, you don't need On the uh, CB350, we give you uh, the plug attached to the cord. All machines come with a cord. The plug's on it. It's a special safe twist lock plug. And we give you the, what they call the female or the receptacle for your electrician to put into the wall. Uh, I do that because uh, you, if you've noticed your clothes dryer is 220 and it's three prong, you never unplug your clothes dryer. But if you do, it's kind of dangerous because you got those three plugs. Two, two of those wires will kill you, one's a ground. Uh, but in an ice cream parlor, if you put one of those plugs on, it's 11 o'clock at night, you finally trained someone else to make the ice cream. They've been working all day. They're tired. Their hands are wet because they just finished rinsing the machine. And now you want them to play with 220 three-prong electricity? That's dangerous. We have a twist lock that goes in and locks like that. It's, it's the safest plug on earth. So, I mean, you could wrap your hands around it and you're not gonna you know, risk anything. On the bigger machines, it doesn't come with a plug because they're too big. I don't, it's too much voltage for you to be playing with. So we wire it into an $80, between $60 and $80 box on the back. Safety box. How much? A safety box, I said. Okay, 60. And the beauty, safety box. Safety box. The, I don't wanna unplug it, but the, easy, the nice thing is we're in Florida. We're the lightning capital of the world. I mean, we get unbelievable storms. Um, our phone system blew out over the weekend 
because a uh, lightning hit down the street. Um, if I know that and I've got an expensive machine, what's better than to go over at night and just pull that red handle down? No power can get to the machine. Plus, if I train my employees that that handle must be down when you're assembling the machine. I mean, there's no way this is coming on accidentally, but you can never be too safe. If that handle's down, there's no power. You put it in, you lock it up, everything's finished, now we apply the power. I, I got zapped uh, when I was 16 working in the factory with three phase 220 volt and it threw me across the room. And they said that's what made me what I am today. You know, a little odd. Uh, <laughs> Panel. Yes. The Direct wired into the yeah, it's into that into that box and then to the breaker panel. And that's called a safety box. Uh, yeah. It's usually known as a safety or a kill or a disconnect. Okay. Uh, switch. Hmm. It's Just called, saying switch. It's called a nice switch. Nice switch. And and Mike is uh, an electrician. So it's a big safety factor, and for what little it costs you, it's a great idea. Yes, uh, but then again, I'm here in uh, Tampa, Florida, lightning capital of the world. When Paul and I leave for work in the morning, we unplug the toaster. But I literally read about a, a business that I knew that the, uh, the blender was plugged in and turned off and burned down the store. That, that's scary. It was made in China. Uh, and it didn't have underwriter laboratory or NSF the way we do. Those are very expensive certifications and we have the very best. It, so, Steve, for the 350, are you, when we get it for off the crate, it's already wired up in the back of the machine and then it's got like a five or six foot whip, I guess? Yeah, six foot. And then the, you said you provide the female, is that for a wall mount or is that for, a, for to like this whip that you have down here? Uh, it's for going right into the wall, the just, wall. just like an on off switch. The, the electrician will come and run your wires in advance and they'll be hanging out of somewhere out the back. Yeah. Uh, preferably off the ground because you're splashing water around. Uh, and that will be there and it's, it's in the wall and you just go in and twist lock like that. Yeah. It, it's real easy. It's got a pin on it so you can't do it the wrong way. Um, and that's my thing. It's electrical safety. Yeah. Yes. What's the, what's the late time now on machines? I'm sorry? The lead time after an order? Lead time is, uh, we tell people right now, eight weeks on the CB350, uh, but we're targeting six. And we've been hitting six. Is that uh, to my door or like... Ready to, ship, ready to ship. Ready to ship? Yeah. And then uh, shipping is not that, that far. Uh, Atlanta is two days. Uh, Chicago's three days. Wyoming might be five days. Uh, it depends on how far you get out. They don't really go beyond a week. Yes. Is the CV 350 a good machine to start off with to start like producing? So you said I have to run that twice to get one of these cups. Yeah. I think it's the very best machine to get started with uh, because of price and what it'll produce. It produces double what the 200 does, and then you go from half a tub to one tub to two tubs. These get pricey. This one is uh, 29 5 now. I'm dating these because six months from now they could be higher with the inflation we've got. Uh, and people are going to see it 10 years from now and say, but you offered it for 29.5 and now it's 97,000. Um, this one is 2,000 more. So the, your choice should be the CB350 or the 24 uh, based on labor. Uh, the bigger you go, the less labor because they're all going to make ice cream in the same amount of time uh, and ices. Will have a 24. You you can't yeah. you can't be successful and survive with a, a smaller machine because you'll be working round the clock. This is a 24, right? No, 24 on the end. Oh, yeah. So eventually, now the good news is, if you do start with a six quart and you spend 13, 13 five. If today. you spend 13 and you use it for eight months, nine months until you are ready for the bigger one, out of 13, you'll sell it in 15 minutes for 11. I mean, you, you, it won't live be on eBay for 15 minutes. So you won't lose any money. The, the nine months is to save up the difference 
to the larger machine. Because once you get the larger machine, your whole world opens up. You won't be killing yourself working every day making ice cream. It'll be three times a week maybe, or twice a week if you want to put in six hours. So it'll change your life. But make no mistake, you will have the larger one if you're going to be a, a working, moving forward ice cream store. They really don't last more than uh, a couple hours on eBay. Someone compared it to uh, a Rolex watch, which was a really good analogy. You, you'll notice there's no Rolex here. <laughs> I can't afford it. But if I had a $20,000 Rolex that I bought today, in three years, I could probably sell it for $20,000 because it's now going up to $27,000. And every year that goes by, our prices will go up. Nothing is going down. And so uh, you, your machine for sale for uh, 13000 instead of my you know, fourteen five in a few years uh, is going to look like a good deal. But I'll warn you, this happens all the time. The day you sell your CB350 off is the day your uh, best friend walks through the door and says, hey, you know that second store that you've been talking about, uh, a small one, like 700, 900 square feet, 20 miles away? I just found one and it's the, the rent is cheap, we could take the CB350, move it up there, teach the manager, and now we don't have to ship ice cream 20 miles. Well, it's too late, you just sold it on eBay. And what's the price difference between the, the 24 and the 12? Today, 19, uh, April <laughs> of right 2022. Now. That's uh, the 24 quart is 31.5, uh, 30.29.5, and 13.5. It's only two thousand dollars to get double the production or cut your labor in half. Now, a lot of people just says, "Yeah, you're going to own a 24." Before you do, you're going to call up and you're going to say, um, "Oh my gosh, I, uh, business is so huge. We need a 24 quart." I said, "How many hours a day are you running?" Well, we're running it uh, ten hours a day. I'm exhausted. Well, you don't need another 24. You go out and you hire. Police, fire, or military. They, uh, the police and fire all have second jobs. We don't pay them enough. And they can come in at 11 o'clock at night, work the graveyard shift, take your three-by-file card because you're confident enough in your business to hand it over to another professional, and let them work from 11 at night till 6 in the morning making your ice creams, and then they go home. You just doubled the output of that machine. However, can I throw a however? Sure. However. When you have your ice cream store, you're going to be very reluctant to turn over production to somebody else. A fireman, a policeman, it sounds good in theory, but you're not going to sleep while they're making ice cream. He's an ice cream maker. I'm a businessman. Uh, I, I made Christy uh, from, she worked her way up, as I said this morning, from uh, being uh, in, in the parts department to a vice president. I did it because I realized how old I am. And I realized someday there's got to be continuity uh, between my wife and I and this business. Because this business is going to go on forever. And so she's being trained to do everything I do. I don't just teach her how to make ice cream. I don't teach, teach her how to uh, sell machines. I teach her how to pay payroll, uh, how to look at a profit and loss statement. If you can't do that in your business, you're always going to be one store and you're always going to be limited. You've got to delegate authority because I know some of the younger people in the audience they're not going to be happy with one store. They're looking at five or six stores. And you can't do it all. You're spending 10 hours making ice cream. It's the hardest thing to learn in business. It's the hardest thing to let go is delegating authority. But you got to do it. How's it looking? It must look delicious. Oh, it looks great. So, Steve, how long for the motor and the compressor, how long do you say they'll run on these machines? It's impossible to say. Uh, Your grandchildren will take over the machine. The average Emory Thompson lasts, uh, on average, 40 years. Some last 35, some last 60. We have way too many machines out there that are 60 years old. But compressors are a purchased item, and uh, so are motors. And you get an electrical uh, voltage shunt go through or a voltage drop. Voltage drops are interesting. As they reduce the amount of power into your store because it's so incredibly hot today, um, the, the heat of the motor goes up. Less voltage, more heat. That could burn them out. Uh, so I've seen something burn out after a year. I've seen something burn out after uh, 40 years. What's the warranty on the compressor? One year parts and labor. 
same as on, the, same on the, the whole motor. machine. Yeah, the plus motor. lifetime technical support. We don't do. You got to read the fine print of a contract if you buy someone else's machine and they say it has a five-year warranty. Anybody ever buy a Sears battery? I know I have, and it has a five-year warranty. And at four years and eleven months, when the battery goes back and you take it to them, uh, it, and that's the key, you have to take it to them. They don't come to you. Uh, you take it to them and they give you a dollar ninety-eight because it says prorated. Well, it was prorated going down over the five years, or it says. Uh, must be, compressor must be returned FOB manufacturer, uh, meaning the person who built it, uh, and then it has to be inspected, and if they find that it was their fault, they will send you a new compressor. Meanwhile, what do you do for three months while your machine is down waiting for that compressor under the warranty? So the warranty that we get from Copeland is one year, and so we give exactly the same warranty they do. A lot of people just filter in, they, add, they jack up the price. You'll notice that we're, on the bigger machines, we're anywhere from you know, six to $9,000 less money. And so, one of the things they've built into it is a phony five-year warranty. If I, if I do have something like that happen, who do I call to make a repair? Hey, Mike, who do they call if they have a repair? Yeah, Mike yeah, McDonald. Yeah, but so I'm in Dallas, so how For does what? Mike help me? Uh, because Mike, uh, because we're in 143 countries. Over 36,000, was it 36,800 machines? Somewhere around there. So you just have a local rep that Mike helps coordinate that comes out and looks at the machine? First, we talk to you. Yeah. I talked to three people over the weekend. One of them was at uh, 8.30 Sunday night. Uh, because we tell you we're here from uh, 8 in the morning till 9 at night, seven days a week. Nobody has service like us. Because 99% of the time, you made a mistake. I can't tell you. Where that is that Dasher around? Right. I don't know. Where? No. I don't see it. It's over there. Put it back. Oh, okay. Um, this is real simple. This is ninety percent of the calls that Mike and I get. These blades have to go in. I mean, it's not very hard. It's one piece here and two blades. These are just holding it. We drilled a little dimple in the front of the blade. We tried to tell people. That the front end is cut off like a hacksaw, the back end is curved, there's a curve there to match the curvature of the barrel. They couldn't see that after 10 years so, or any time, so we drilled a little dimple here and here. We tell them, the customer, it's in the book, it's when we talk to them, it's up on the videos like this. The two dimples have to be seen before you put the door on. Now the blades are incorrectly. It's, it's three pieces, it's not that hard. Just see the two dimples. I call people, uh, people call me up, my machine froze up after three batches. I said, is the door really frosty? Yes, it is. Uh, I said, how's the product? Uh, it's soupy on the inside. Uh, is there a buildup of ice on the walls of the machine? Oh yeah, it's loaded with ice. I guess it's working great. No, you put, flipped one of these blades around and now it's backwards. And then I hear, I couldn't do that. I've been making ice cream for 347 years. I could never make such I a stupid mistake. It. And I tell people, I did it on live TV. I did it in one of these uh, performance or demonstrations. And so if I can do it, the owner of the company, um, and I've been here since I was 16 years old, anybody can do it. So I tell them that, and I said, you know, humor me. Just go back and check. And they say, okay. Uh, I said, call me back. Let me know I was, I was right. I never hear from them because they found out that one of these blades was facing the wrong way. Now it's not even scraping the walls. Never. I never made that. That's the kind of calls I we never get. Made it. Or another guy calls Steve. up, he's got a water-cooled machine, and um, it was actually Malik Rose. So if anybody knows Malik Rose, San Antonio Spurs, he's now with ESPN. He has a, a number of uh, Italian ice businesses, or had. I don't know his status right now. He called up Saturday night at 8.30, and I always ask the question, I've trained my staff, to ask the question, uh, when did it last run right? Well, Malik said, and what are you making? Oh, I'm making cherry ice. When did it last run right? He said, well, uh, 20 minutes ago when I made lemon ice. Okay, if it made lemon ice and it's a five-year-old machine, the blades are in correctly, they're in properly, the refrigeration's working, the thing is turning, that's working. Hey, Malik, taste the product. What's it taste like? He goes, oh, God, Steve, it's awful. It tastes like cherry juice and water. I said, yeah, I know. You left the seven pounds of sugar out. Put the seven pounds in, and now your machine runs fine. If that had been Taylor, 
Uh, Taylor has a great service network, uh, but they don't sell batch freezers anymore. We ran them out of it. Uh, Taylor would have said, oh, we'll be there Monday. So the guy's down for two days. We'll be there Monday. The, the, the Taylor guy comes in, changes the expansion valve for $500, runs a batch of ice with you. You have a $1,000 bill, and the machine works. And, and the owner is going, isn't that wonderful? They came. I only lost two days of business, and the machine's working great now. Well, he paid $1,000 because he left the sugar out, and we had diagnosed it in less than a minute on the phone because all we do is build batch freezers. You can't buy a DeLorean car for me. You can't buy a deep fat fryer. Uh, I don't do Thai pan ice cream. I don't do nitrogen. We do batch freezers, and we are the gold standard in the industry. So that's our service, and that's our story. Nobody does it better. Yeah. But, but back to his question, he's in Dallas. Okay. And if let's he, say something did go wrong with the compressor. Let's say the compressor blew. What's the answer to that? We have a, Mike has a list of people that we use um, that we will call one of them to uh, make the change. And uh, if it's out of warranty, you're going to pay to have it shipped uh, to there and put in. But Jeff will verify this one. If you own your own home, uh, I'm sure you don't, you don't think about this, but I'll bet you know the name of an electrician. And I'll bet you know the name of a plumber, because toilets back up and overflow on Sunday night at 7 o'clock, and who are you going to call? You know, not Ghostbusters. You better have a name of a plumber. And I think every one of us who owns a home has the name of a plumber and an electrician. If you're going to be in this business, and you've got freezers, and you've got dipping cabinets, you've got batch freezers, and you've got refrigerators, what do you need in that business, Jeff? You need a refrigeration man. So when you go into business, Go around to different restaurants and say, hey, I'm opening an ice cream parlor. Who do you use for refrigeration service? Because Taylor isn't coming out Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock to fix your machine. But if you know Louie from Louie's Refrigeration, you can probably get him in. This is a normal thing that you need to have in business. You've got a banker. Uh, you've got an electrician. You've got a plumber. You need a refrigeration person. Otherwise, you're setting yourself up for a big fall when that $15,000 walk-in box stops working, and you don't know that it's nothing more than pushing a reset button. Yes? You see, those blades last about five years? Five to six. And how do you know when they're wore out? They, they you call up and you say that the freezing time's getting longer, and usually it's over time. It went from eight minutes to nine minutes to ten minutes. And even then, we're probably going to look up your machine and say it's only four and a half years old. Did you change the springs? The springs wear out. They're very cheap. And so you change the springs, it runs like a brand new machine. Okay. Real simple machine. Yeah, you, and how much they cost? The, the blades? Yeah. I have no idea. They don't let me do prices. <laughs> I don't let me do prices. I once admitted to knowing refrigeration when I was 22, because I'd been doing it since I was 16. They sent me out on every refrigeration call there was. So if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. But if you want to get on your phone during break and talk to Christy, uh, because our, that's who's out today is our uh, parts lady. Uh, she can tell you right away what the price is. It's cheap. Christy. Especially over five years. The competition is 45 days. That's how long they last. 45 to 90. Six years. There's no comparison. Days, that's all right. Yeah, that's all they do. Maybe 90. Yes. How long did you say this, or how often did you have to change the springs, did you say? If you do it once a year, you'll never have a problem. Uh, I got a call last night, and they had freezing time of 14 minutes. And I said, I'm home. I can't look up your records. Uh, when did you get the machine? We bought it used uh, six years ago. OK, so number one, it's used. That means we don't know how old it is. Um, have you changed the springs in six years? No. We suggest you do it once a year. Call tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, order springs. Uh, you can have them as early as 10 o'clock the next morning. And all of a sudden, your machine is going to run like a brand new machine. Everybody else would have sent out the repair guy and changed the expansion valve. And he would have noticed at the same time, your repair record shows that you haven't done O-rings or springs. And I can make a lot of money changing your springs, says the repairman. I run a very honest business. You don't stay in business 117 years in the United States if you're not the best at what you do. So you said so O-rings, the, there's O-rings on the back of the shaft, I know that. Where else are there O-rings? Um, that's it for the bigger machines. This one has an O-ring in the gate. They're about $9, and you do it maybe once a year. Two on the back, two on here, 
There's a big one on the front door, there's a big one on that front door, and they go about eight or ten years. Usually, an employee will throw it out in the trash uh, before it wears out. And you you'll call, and you know, they say, what do I do? I say, fire the employee. <laughs> do you recommend shops keep a backup of all those O-rings just at all times since, let's say, an employee does accidentally throw it away? Not since the Internet was invented. Uh, <laughs> It's an odd answer because I used to tell people, keep them in the bottom of your cash register drawer. Who has a cash register nowadays? Yeah. Nobody. What do you mean? Hmm? Yeah. What do you mean? They do it all by square. No, they don't. Well, modern people Every do. Every ice cream store in the world has a cash register. Well, the idea is they're just going to get lost. So don't bother. We can have them on your doorstep by uh, 1030 tomorrow morning. So just overnight them. And if it's an O-ring, it's not critical unless you lose it. If they throw out your front cover gasket, that's worth overnighting. If it's something you've let go for four years, what is another day or two gonna matter? So if, but if we make they, all our own parts or we buy them within the United States. So everything here, when you see this main assembly building, everything's in stock. So that big gasket that's on the front door, if you had to, you could run it without it? No, you could not, but it's not gonna wear out. Yeah. People replace it because it, get, it gets yellow and ugly, but it doesn't wear out. Yeah. So Steve, if I understand correctly, if there's a problem, you guys are not able to troubleshoot over the telephone, we should go out and go for uh, an nutrition or a refrigeration expert at home? We're going to, no, we're going to, If well, you need to know one because uh, I can't get you someone to come out Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock. But if you call Mike, this. he's going to tie you up with someone. He's going to do without contacts all over the country. Yeah, we have them all over the country. I've been running these machines for 13 years. I've made close to 70,000 gallons of ice cream. No problems. Yeah, so you've never... Really, you're he, being hypothetical, and it's really not going to... Just like when you buy a new car. You don't ask the guy who's selling you the new car, well, what happens if the valve springs break? What happens if I put too much water in the gas tank? <laughs> it's, you know, it's a brand new car. Ten years from now, you'll be calling up and saying, I've had this Emory Thompson for 10 years and it is the only piece of equipment in this store that has not been repaired at least once. I'll tell you That's a quick story. Are. A quick story. Got time for a quick story? Yeah, and then we'll break for lunch. Okay. A quick story. Uh, in my class, a couple of years ago, a guy took my boot camp and he, his father was stationed in the Marshall Saint Islands. Christy? You know the Marshall Islands, the way out there? And so he went to visit his father, and he's walking around these old buildings that are not used anymore in the Marshall Islands, and he sees an Emory Thompson machine. And it happened to have been from 1946, uh, when, there when there were regular troops, I guess, or whoever, there, stationed there. Somebody, there was a commissary, and they made ice cream. So he found the machine from 1946, got it cranked up, and that's part of his business today. And that machine has a fatal flaw in it. Uh, Heliarc welding had not been invented yet. So when, we, when my father built that machine and he put the back wall onto the freezing cylinder, he had to silver solder it, like building a transistor radio. So over 40, 50, 60, 70 years of the dasher spinning around like that, it's also hitting the back wall. It breaks the silver solder, and after 50 years, 60 years, the machine is busted. Uh, we invented Heliarc welding a long time ago, not Emory Thompson, but the world. So that's welded, that's one piece. Now we don't even make them like that. You can look at this barrel over here. Uh, it's, it's that thick. It's, it's thicker than anybody else's on earth. And that's what's called a stamping. A stamping was always known, it's for little stuff, like a sink. Uh, we take a big sheet of stainless steel and we have a template that matches that. Boom, it comes down and you got a sink. But you can only do that uh, with a thin piece of stainless steel. We have developed a way where you're going to see on that little tiny lines, thousands of them on the side of the barrel. Each one of those is a stamping, taking a piece of plate stainless steel and pounding it into that barrel. It's perfect in every dimensional way there is. There is no back wall anymore. So that, that machine today is far, far superior than the, to the ones that were lasting 60 years. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't ever cut my price uh, when I improve my quality. I will not cheapen the product. It's, it's going to be the very best or I won't build it. Mercedes thinks they own that, 
uh, expression, but we've been building them better and, and than that uh, for a long, long time. Um, did we want to do, well, I guess we are doing questions answered right now with this. What other questions <laughs> do you have? Because we're going to break for lunch. Oh, uh, their eyes are glazed. Their eyes are glazed. So you said earlier it's 16 minutes to run the machine twice to make one. If you were making vanilla and you were fast, a batch takes eight minutes. So eight and eight is 16. Give me 20. So 20, 40, 60. I'm making three tubs, three, six, nine, gal nine gallons an hour uh, out of that machine. Okay. And the 24 is four times that. And that's two times that. But if you're 23 years old and the banks won't lend you money, uh, th this might as well be a, 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 a trip on Elon Musk's uh, uh, rocket to the Mars because you can't afford it. So you start with this, you get into business, and you plow the money back into the business. It makes you a lot of money, and it makes it very quickly. Instead of going out and buying uh, a new sports car, you plow the money back in so that you can expand your business by four times uh, in the same hours by getting uh, a larger machine. One guy on social media accused me of saying, oh, Steve's got this conspiracy to sell you a CB350 so that you have to buy a new machine. What a lot of, bleep it out, uh, what a lot of baloney because I'm trying to get you into business so that you will make a lot of money and do I have an alternative uh, approach to it? Of course I do. If you make a lot of money and you open a fourth, fifth, sixth store, where are you gonna go to buy your batch freezer? You're gonna call Steve Thompson. So yeah, I'm gonna sell you a new machine, but I'm selling it to you because you couldn't afford anything bigger than that four years ago, and, and now you're going out and buying a house and getting a fifth location and buying a fancy car and a bigger Emory Thompson because you won't believe it till you get into it. What was the square footage of your first store? 56 square feet. And when you finished? Uh, uh, 36. 3,600 square feet of selling ice cream. And uh, you're going to meet people in life. I always get a kick out of telling this. At least I enjoy it. You're going to meet people <laughs> in your, your life who brag about how much money they have. Oh, I have so much money. The banks are calling me. They just love me. I loan money to the banks. And then you meet the people with the real money. I'm staring at them. Uh, you meet the people with the real money, and they say, well, how's business? And they go, we do okay. Yeah, they do okay, like, you know, they've got uh, a house in the Caymans and a house out in Southampton and uh, people but who make a lot of money. Really, that's not really the judge of happiness. No, it's not the judge of happiness, but it certainly it is, uh, it is no, a measuring it stick. It doesn't help at all. It's a measuring stick of how well all your labor You don't need did. measuring sticks. Remember the president. Oh, that's easy to say. Walk softly and carry a big that's stick. That's easy to say when you're have been a very successful man selling ice cream. But when you're out and you're trying to, you know, I remember back when it was like, you know, to try to make that mortgage every month. Uh, it was tough. We forget that as we get older. You know, we, we end up saying we do okay. Right. Let's break for lunch. I'll start bringing it in. Yeah. One more. So the, from one flavor to the next, I did orange pineapple, and now I'm going to do another uh, ice. I'm going to do... Um, Pink champagne lemonade sorbet. So they're still a sorbet. It's still close to what I was doing. So I don't have to do a lot of rinsing to the machine. So I'm going to hand out the formula. There you go. And we'll crank this out. Okay. Look at all the tubs go. She washed all the tubs. Tell me what you need. Oh, I'm good. Okay. Yes. What? Your thing that fell the last time. It looks Again, like the sand? It looks like it's not on the cricket. I just want to let you know. Let me look. This machine's 12 years old. They, I can't even get a new machine out of my own factory because they ship too fast. And the demand's too great. Eight, 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 eight to six. So in other words, somebody here could buy that at a good price if they're willing to buy it today. No, they can't. <laughs> because then I'd be without a machine. And then what do I do for a living? Okay, Jeff just rinsed out the machine, the, his machine. Are you, which one are you using? 
I'm not using that right. one. Okay. I was, was going to make fun of you. He didn't use a spaghetti colander, so now all the chocolate chips are hung up in the uh, the thing. Dry, Tell me where that drain. spaghetti colander is. It's here somewhere. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> so, anyway, buy a cheap spaghetti colander, put it in your sink, pour all your rinse water through there, so that there's a few chips or a few nuts or a few raisins. A few, a few, a few adds up to a clogged drain. If you put everything through the spaghetti colander, all your rinse water, none of it goes down the drain, clogs it up, and you don't have to call uh, the Greek. Actually, the culprit were those grits from <laughs> Grape Nuts Ice Cream. It's killing you that it was good, isn't it? <laughs> okay, this is a real easy one. Um, two bottles of sparkling wine. I'm told these pop when they go off. They're all easy. I have to get Christy to assist me on this for a minute. Lemonade powder, strawberries, and two pounds of sugar. I'll be right back. I'm going to get my... You want me to entertain menus. them? Hey, Christy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I need your help. So what about that grape nuts ice cream? You no. liked it? Yeah. yeah. I feel like what, uh, anybody uh, not like it for a specific reason? Right, Steve? I thought it was okay. I'm just making the powder, right? Uh, I like yes. the crunchability in there, which is unusual in ice cream. You generally don't find that dense crunch in ice cream. What do you need? Oh, I got it. Parfait. What? Parfait? It's yeah. killing you. It was great, wasn't it? Uh, Did you hear all the stuff he said this morning beforehand? Boy. Uh, you pay attention to what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've got the knife. <laughs> Watch what you say about me. Careful, that might go pop. Yeah, that's why I'm aiming it at Jeff. He's <laughs> the other way. Facing it this way. Oh, sorry. So Steve just wanted me to do this for him. Everybody's seen Country Time Lemonade, yes? Yes, ma'am. Everybody. Okay, easy directions. Follow them. That's what I'm doing. Two quarts water, up to the two quart line. And voila. Uh, don't, don't hit want me. Want me to do that? No, you obviously didn't hang around the same circles I did. We were taught how to do this when we were two yeah, years old. Yeah, they taught you to aim it towards the floor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, did mine do that? Didn't no, it, it didn't. It didn't lose it, well. Do the cork. I'll show you a cork trick. Okay. You see a cork trick while he's working? I want the cork. Okay, you get the cork. It just came out of the bottle. So if you take them like this and then do this. Two pounds of sugar. Right mm -hmm. here. Now, can anybody, can you do that? <laughs> I'll do it real slow. Even somebody like you could do it. Oh, uh, here we go. Watch. Very <laughs> slow, okay? Very slow. That's a good one. Well, that's good. Want to try it? No. no. <laughs> really? Nobody? That's a chicken. You want these? Yes, sir. For what? I put them in a big jug that I have on top of my kitchen counters. Like and a, then? Like it, a decoration. If she and saves then. enough of them, she gets a free uh, ice cream. A, a cruise. <laughs> free a ice cruise. cream. Remember the old cigarettes? Save all your packs yes, of cigarettes, pay your right. cigarette money. That's right. And uh, the one day you can take a cruise on it. A Anybody cruise want to, to uh, Sloan Kettering. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sugar. I'm going to leave it at a quart and a half so it has room for strawberries. Okay. I say that, but it's really for me. And then you're good. You just need to puree it. I'll do that for you. Oh, the machine. Yeah. Okay. Well, now, which one's, uh, what am I using? All of that. This and this? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. So that's going to be no, two. No, no, I, no, I'm not going to. Yeah, I like that. Okay, so we've got those ingredients. The um, sparkling white wine or pink champagne. Uh, the country time pick lemonade. Um, the strawberries we're going to throw in. And the two pounds of sugar. So I'm just going to mix the sugar between the two. It doesn't matter how much I put in each container. Why? Say? The champagne rises with sugar. Oh. Okay. 
We're good. Where'd my other one go? Look at that. <laughs> I didn't know that. So, let's go ahead and put it in that one, shall we? Yeah, why not? Now, I don't have to completely dissolve it, but if I just take some of the edge off of that sandpaper, I'm better off. You guys will really like this one. Again, check the gate. <laughs> hey, you're back? Okay, Just for the one. champagne one. Okay. You know, apparently I am not that great at this, so. I like to buy the frozen strawberries over fresh because as the berries thaw, they create their own juice and it's very sweet and it works amazing when you make ices or ice creams. <laughs> and they smell great. I don't know if you can see, maybe, well, I'll do this. Okay. I've got all the liquid in there. I'm going to go to the infinite overrun control, make ice cream, go to the next page where it says uh, sorbet sorbetto, hit start, turn on the refrigeration, and we're off to the races. Ooh. I was showing him the juice. Okay. Too much? No, it's just easier in the bag to pour. But well, I was okay. showing him the juice. Can you see the juice? Yeah, you can see it right there. Huh? You can see it right on the side. Yeah. Great, thank you. Welcome. All right, guys. Now, since these are <laughs> soft, the machine's going to puree them like a Cuisinart. Don't try this with any other machine, but you can't do it. The opening's only that wide, and they do that because they don't want you to put anything into the machine because their beaters and their cylinders aren't strong enough to take it. That's why over 94% of all Italian ice in the world is made on Emory Thompson's because you're literally making wet cement. You know, we're, we're going to drink it, but it's the consistency of wet cement. Now, doesn't that beat using an extract? Look at that, all fresh stuff. The main reason to use frozen fruit as opposed to fresh fruit is the consistency year round. So the, the mangoes, the peaches, the strawberries, it'll be the same when you make ice cream in January and when you make it in, when the fruit may be in season in July. Uh, so that's why fresh fruit is definitely better. Every bag of fresh fruit, of frozen fruit, is sweet. And while adding everything in with the refrigeration on, uh, I saved a, a minute and 34 seconds. You take that over 10 years and it's almost half a day. Oh, How about boy. that? <laughs> Was that a dig this way? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Any questions so far on the recipe? Yes. Now, I've been reading that it's often best to macerate so you don't get the large ice crystals. The machine's going to grind them up. Okay. So, so no. But post-production freezing. I, I, well, I came up with two terms I call fruit flavor and fruit identity. So we might as well use this. Um, normally, if this was an ice cream, I would put half my strawberries into the machine. I'd let it grind them up like a Cuisinart, and for every particle of dairy, there's going to be a particle of strawberry right next to it. I call that my fruit flavor. If I was blindfolded and tasted it, I'd say, yep, that's, that's strawberry ice cream. I take the blindfold off, and all I see is this pale pink product with little specks of red in it. I go, hey, where, where's the beef? Where, where's the, uh, where are the strawberries? You can't see them. So I want the identity. We eat with our eyes. We come into the store, we see the ice cream, we, we, I, I want that. Or we see it on a cone. I want what she's having. So my second strawberries, if I was using fresh, I would have uh, cut them into halves uh, and laid them out on a cookie sheet. It's called sugaring the fruit. You lay them out on a cookie sheet uh, and then you sprinkle sugar over the top of them 
and you throw it in the refrigerator overnight. Uh, the, the, the moisture in the strawberries will absorb that sugar, and so now those, sugar, those strawberries are sweet, and they're not going to turn into little rocks. Because otherwise, if you've made homemade ice cream uh, with an old hand crank like my grandfather was doing before he invented this, this thing runs too slow and too long. It takes almost an hour. And so you put fresh strawberries in there, and they're going to freeze up like little marbles because of all the moisture in there. You're, you're biting into a rock. And um, so by sugaring the fruit, that works well. If you're doing blueberries, you put into uh, a container like this, let's say a small one. You put your blueberries in here, add sugar, a little bit of water, shake it up and put it in the fridge overnight. Uh, even though they have a, a thicker skin, the, the blueberries, they'll absorb that sugar. And now they're sugared and they're ready to add as it's coming out. So I get the best of both worlds, uh, the fruit flavor and the fruit identity. When other batch freezers make ice cream and they make strawberry, because they can't put it into the machine, uh, everything, they can either do an extract, which is not the same as strawberries, uh, they have to open the gate partway and shake in the strawberries. They're making vanilla ice cream with strawberries in it. We're making strawberry ice cream that, again, every particle of dairy, a particle of strawberry right next to it. So our flavor is going to be far more intense than anybody else. When I put a Reuben Mattis and his mother in business, that was haagen uh, six miles from my Bronx factory, I was only about 22 years old, and they were using all batch freezers, our bigger ones than this, and that's how they began the business. And it was true homemade ice cream, it was spectacular. Um, then they went national, and uh, we can go up to 250,000 gallons a year with you. After that, you're probably gonna buy a continuous freezer, but a continuous freezer is jumping back. You can't put anything into a 1,000 gallon an hour continuous freezer except liquid mix. You can put in an extract, no strawberries, no cookies, no nothing. There's a $40,000 machine that attaches to the front and it injects the cookies. So if you look carefully at haagen and I mean really carefully, their chocolate chip uh, or their Oreo cookie ice cream is vanilla ice cream with pieces of Oreo injected into it. Nothing can go into the machine. Plus it makes a whole different texture. And so uh, when you uh, call me up and 10 years and your ego has just really taken over you and you now want to buy a continuous freezer and get away from what made you successful. The old expression, what, what got you here won't get you there. Um, like say Ample Hills up in New York, they expanded right away from Emory Thompson's and I warned them and I warned them, they weren't that big. And they went to continuous freezer and pff, business goes right downhill because someone walks in and says, hey, you know what? There's nobody in Brooklyn or Los Angeles making old-fashioned ice cream. I think I'll open an ice cream parlor. Meanwhile, Ample Hills was getting wonderful uh, press, and then it was all blown. So, that's freezer. What kind of overrun does a little hand crank machine like that do? Uh, this will do about, do about 60 to 70% overrun, and, and not lower. Uh, so it's, it's relatively high, especially the ones with the motor. Uh, when I was a kid, you had to turn a crank. When I was a kid, you had to walk both ways uphill to school in a snow blizzard. So it's all relative. But this one, yeah, you're just, this is fun for about the first 30 seconds when you're, you know, five years old. And then after that, you know, it, it gets boring. But this is the exact thing my grandfather was using in, two, in 1903. And uh, he was using it to... Uh, make ice cream for a department store. They didn't have ice cream parlors. They had uh, uh, ice cream was sold at a pharmacy or in the basement of uh, Macy's or Lord and & Taylor or Bloomingdale's. You went there for your candy. That's why the affili affiliation of candy and ice cream. You went for candy, candy baked goods, and ice cream. Um, and that's how the business began. Ours and the ice cream business. See, what do you think of using uh, a jam? Yeah. I love it. I, I use Smuckers all the time. Uh, I, I think it's great stuff. Um, I make a peanut butter and jelly ice cream that is uh, Smuckers peanut butter and then Welch's grape jelly because you can't beat Welch's grape jelly for a, a PB&J. Uh, and it makes a fun ice cream. It's, it's a nice combination. But yeah, rather than go out and buying a big number, t a case like this of butterscotch, 
Um, I'll go buy butterscotch or caramel um, uh, smuckers as I need it. So invest, instead of investing $240 in three cases minimum order, I've got you know, eight jars. And I look and see if they ever go on sale, and then I buy everything they own. Do you put it at the end or the beginning of the boat? Um, it depends on what I'm making. Uh, salted caramel, I put most of it right into the machine. Uh, but you can also warm it up in a double boiler. Microwave's a little dicey. And, um, and then just pour it in as a stream. It's called variegating when you're, you're pouring it in. And you can either pour it in or you can um, you know, pour in some and then take a spoon and work your way through it. Or you can take a pastry bag and put it right up against here and squeeze. So there's a lot of ways to do it. Jeff has a technique that I haven't perfected where he puts it into here, adds some mix, and then it's real loose and he's pouring it like that. And that'll be, you wanna describe that real quick? How to make a variegate? Okay, it's in the videos starring Jeff. Okay, we've been nine minutes and 42 seconds. We're freezing nicely. How'd you get on variegates making an Italian ice? Using jams. And I said smuckers. And you know, yes. one of the, go ahead. My question is, um, I'm sorry, I can't hear her. I'm sorry? How much would you say you waste of the product when you're experimenting on it? Like if you're coming up with a recipe, do you ever just throw the whole batch out because it tastes god awful? I really don't experiment. Uh, I know that if I know how to make one kind of flavor, it's mathematically going to be the same for the other, only a different taste. As I said this morning, if I can make strawberry, I can make raspberry. I can make Bordeaux cherry. Those are singular ones. Like you said, peanut butter and jelly. How did you... Uh, I have some general rules. Uh, I'm going to use... Uh, they're for a 24-quart machine, the two-tub machine. I'm going to use... Uh, about a quart of peanut butter and an equal amount of jelly. And if it's an intense flavor, maybe I'll throttle that back. But pretty much all my stuff is a quart. Uh, if, I'm using, uh, if I'm using chocolate chips, a quart of them. Uh, if it's not quarts, it's pounds. I use uh, two, uh, two bags or two pounds of cookies. Um, you, you'll develop your own rules, but uh, it's, it's really that simple so that you're not doing a lot of experimenting. Yes? No, the machine will check it. Do I want to check it? Huh? Get the top open on the machine. Uh, that's okay. That's just, that's just a dust cover. Doesn't matter if it's open or not. But this is what ice cream's about, is I'm just checking for the consistency. Now, I run into great trouble talking to you and running this because I'm going to get distracted listening to myself talk and saying, you missed this point, you missed that point and I'm gonna forget about that. What you do is you go out and buy a cheap kitchen timer. Here's a neat one that looks like an airplane. And if you know it's gonna take about 13 minutes, you set it for, say, 11 minutes. And now you can go do other stuff. Uh, this is portable, I can put it in my pocket. You can do it with your iPhone. Um, or you just have it here. And instead of standing around here talking to you, I'm looking at my next flavor and say, okay, I need this much sugar, let me go measure it. So I'm measuring the sugar, I'm measuring the water, getting the flavor ready, bell goes off. Oh, I'll go check it. I watch my wife Paula bake, and she sets the timer for a birthday cake for, say, 24 minutes. I've never seen her pull it at 24 minutes. She checks it at 24 and decides, is that particular flavor ready to go or not, makes a decision, and then comes back in a couple of minutes. So it's, it's not a science, it's an art. And it's not even an art because once you've made about six different batches, you can make anything. I will check it. That's almost to peaking, but not there. Great color. Yeah, and it's all natural. That's, that's the beauty of it. I mean, you uh, and the millennials are so much fun because a millennial mother, she's 38 years old, she's got her five-year-old daughter in tow, and they walk into your store and they see this product and they think it's, you know, let's say it's strawberry ice cream. Oh no, you can't have that. That, red, that color is red dye 40. Oh no, ma'am, that's from the strawberries. Or if I'm making a cherry Italian ice, uh, there's a company I can buy all natural extracts from, uh, Green Mountain Flavors, 
uh, Green Mountain Colors, and he takes concentrated beet juice and turns it into a red color. So the mother's going, oh no, you can't have that. That's red dye 40. You, the owner, oh no, ma'am, that's, uh, that's concentrated beet juice. And she looks at you like, you know, you've got three eyes. And she says, saying to herself, wow, if they go to all that effort just to color the cherry juice, what's the rest of this store like? It must be fantastic. So you're building your own image by what you're leaving out. Oh, that's real nice. You'll have to tell me how it is. Do you recommend not using the colors for the ice? Not today. Not, not nowadays. Well, I would use these natural ones. He's got blue, green, yellow, green mountain flavors. And it's not in Vermont. It's in uh, Illinois. Um, but that part's important because they, the millennials all know what they're eating. And they're just not going to buy your product if it's artificial in any way. Which is great. We can charge more. Okay, I like this. I'm going to turn off the refrigeration switch and out it comes. See how fast that comes out? I think last time I shook that, I knocked it off, didn't I? I should be a Leave it alone. Yeah, leave it alone. Wow, look at the yield on this one. But that's not, that's not a three-gallon tub. But we're all about speed. We're going to get this done and go on to the next one because I, you know, I want to uh, get back to my lounge chair, have a beer, and turn on Oprah. You know, so I'm all about, my machines are all about efficiency. Now, I go to the next flavor, which is darker than this, so maybe Bordeaux cherry. And, and it'll cover over any small amount that's in here. And just because I got a little strawberry in with the Bordeaux cherry, they're both fruits, it's not going to make a difference. And then I'll go to black raspberry, and then I'll call it a day. So, let's try this. You gotta let me know because it's got champagne, I can't have it. I'll scoop it. Let me get the scoop. What'd you call me? Huh? Christy says this is great. She made it at home, so we'll see. And if if you want seconds, you can have it. Yes. Um, I have a question. I guess it's more for Steve. Um, your tray that's on that smaller sheet, the 350. Yeah. Is that how it is on the current design, or yeah. I noticed you have braces on the other ones, which and it's a little more sturdy. It's all dependent on the size of the container. We're using two to four tubs on the bigger one. This is per perfectly sturdy. I'm sorry it fell off, but again, it's a 12-year-old machine. I should check the hooks on it. Uh, but we do not have a problem with that falling off. If we did, we would redesign it, but it works beautifully because sometimes you just want to make things simple. You want to make them as simple as possible because simple doesn't break. And besides, I don't want to be shipping stands, uh, shelves all over the world, so... But this, the temperature you will hold this at. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm not going to sell this. Uh, I have, let's say I have an ice cream parlor and I'm not going to sell this now till uh, next, what is today, Wednesday, next Saturday. I'm going to take it down to about uh, uh, zero to 10 below. Come on, scoop. All right. <laughs> zero to 10 below. Uh, and then I'm going to temper it back up overnight to a scooping temperature of 16. Steve, I have a question regarding that. So the Department of Health sent me a lovely 600-page book on <laughs> rules and regulations, and in there it states that all frozen desserts have to be stored and kept at zero degrees, which is fine for storage but not for serving. How do you... How do you I think if you read it more carefully, it'll say a minimum of six de uh, zero degrees. Zero degrees is nothing. Uh, we like to go 20... This... A specialty freezer behind me called a hardening cabinet goes to 25 below and stays there. That's what makes it right, so unique. I'm talking about serving temperature. You just said 16. Serving temperature, well. They say it has to be zero. This stuff will be, you'll need a hammer and chisel to serve at zero. That's, that's so question. you got to, well, you got to read the, uh, what it says. If they are specifically saying ice cream, there are no standards for ices. 
Uh, I've got the federal book on that. There aren't any standards, but it's all common sense. You know, all you have to do is say to yourself, I can't scoop a product that's a rock. So obviously zero doesn't work. Um, so it's wrong. It's, it's just flat out wrong. And when you talk to the inspector, I don't even think they'll ever bring it up. If it's not liquid, what they're worried about is it's melted and you're serving a liquid product, but you can't sell this as a liquid product. More? more. Three more. Okay. Want me to do it? No, I just don't have room on the How long can you thing. freeze the uh, ice cream mix? How long can you store it Four. in the freezer? Four. Four what? Forever. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I do. I only do the, we only do this every other month, and I don't make ice so cream other than this. Really it's frozen. It's, it's frozen. And it's harder than cement. Yeah. It freezes very nicely. That, that chamber behind you, that refrigerator, that, um, how many does it hold? How many guns does it hold at the bottom end of the tub? It holds uh, 24 of those big tubs. Or hundreds of pints. 24 of them at the bottom end of the tub? Those, but yeah, the whole thing in total holds all that. I have a video on it that's on YouTube, or I can send it to you. He, he holds, Jeff holds uh, the one gallon, so we'll hold what? Double that 50 of them? Oh, this thanks. is three gallons. So now we're almost done. Well, by time three. Well, you know, about like 75 yeah. containers. But it's not a holding freezer. It's called a flash freezer, a hardening cabinet. Um, you can take any box and have it go to 10 below, 15 below, even 20 below. But this is what we would call a warm product. This is about 19 degrees. If I put 50 gallons of 19 degrees into your freezer, the temperature is going to skyrocket up because your box was meant for me to bring home frozen pizzas, frozen green beans, and solid as a rock ice cream. So all the cabinet has to do is hold it like that. We're asking to take this from uh, plus 19 down to minus 25 and hold it there where it won't deteriorate for six months or a year. Uh, so that's a specialty freezer. There's only about three on the market. And this is, this is the, the best one. And the serving temperature in the ice cream? So you, you say six. So put it in there and hold it in there. I mean, the flash is for, to freeze it, but then transfer it over to your storage? No, this is my inventory, not unless I need it. This is my inventory. It could stay in here for months. Okay, that's okay. But if, I, if I'm going to need double this capacity, it's all hard as a rock, 25 yeah, below. I now put it into the chest freezer, which is at 10 below. It's also hard as a rock, and the chest freezer doesn't have to do any work at all. It's just because it received 25 below zero product. If it took 20 plus 20 product and had to pull it down, it'll fail. Throat and, freeze. <laughs> <laughs> yeah? How is it? Is it everybody like it? Strawberry flavor. Any differences, improvements? That's a good one. Oh, good. All right. Good. I'll tell Christy. Yeah. All right, Jeff. Yes. Is sparkling wine just regular wine? Yes, regular wine is flat, and sparkling wine has uh, carbonation in it, carbon dioxide. Uh, champagne uh, is a whole different product. Uh, no, because you're. Think of what you're doing. You're taking a bottle of, let's say, a really good uh, champagne, maybe a Mont Blanc, and you're putting, it, you're putting it into the product. What is the majority of what's in here? Sugar, water, and strawberries. The, the, the wine makes is very little in there. So if I use a $50 bottle versus a $5 bottle, you'll never taste the difference. If I served it to you in a champagne glass, yeah, big difference. So you don't need to go out and buy expensive champagne. Nothing will change. No. They're both carbonated. Yes. You, every state has its law. It was a big success. How about a round of applause for the creator? All right. Let's see. Uh, every state has different laws. Um, and you can talk to them and find out what that limit is, and that's the limit you can't go above. Uh, also, it would be very interesting for me to see an inspector come in and you say, how much alcohol is in here? And you say, well, okay, it's, uh, the state law says 0.07, and mine is 0.06. Prove it. How are you going to prove it? They don't send it out to a lab 
and analyze it for fat content, unless there's people drunk on your front lawn, uh, they're just not going to bother with you. Would you agree with that statement? We're ready for the next one? You don't agree with that statement? It's, it's a complicated statement, but... Uh, Did you have a license? No, of course not. Okay, that's all we need. No, you don't need <laughs> one. It's the, the general rule is if it's an ingredient in your product, you don't need a separate license for it. If you pour anything, that seems to be the threshold. You can't pour it. Uh, and, of course, serving it, the servers have to be of age. You can't have kids doing it. We sell a lot of adult flavors, and we've never had a problem, ever. Uh, in two separate stores, 13 years, never had a problem. Uh, some people claim there is a problem. You know what it's like? If you're going to open a store and you say, okay, let's go to City Hall, and you say, listen, I'm opening a men's shoe store. What do I need to do? Well, before you leave there, you've got seven books on, uh, loading you down with rules and regulations about everything connected with the store. The other way to do it is to go open your store and let them tell you what you did wrong. And that's the way I go. Uh, otherwise, the, the bureaucrats, I don't like to throw those words around, but the people in charge who really work for you, but they don't understand that, they have power. And the power is rules and regs. So I don't go that route. It, there's an expression, it's better to at, beg forgiveness than ask permission. There's another expression from my great, great grandfather says, forget about it. <laughs> it's real simple. Right. Now I'm going to give you all a choice. I'm going to make another flavor. And it's up to you. Uh, we're going to use Butterfinger, the candy bars. And we can either make Butterfinger ice cream or Butterfinger cream ice. Uh, ice cream. Now, who gave God the vote? I don't know. So just by a show of hands, do we want to make Butterfinger ice cream? Or do we want to make Butterfinger cream ice? Cream ice it is. Sorry, Mike. So what I've done is, uh, we have any more bladders here? Yes, I do. Uh, well, I only need... Uh, <laughs> you want me to do a <laughs> quick surgery? And <laughs> I came in this morning with... Everybody loves Butterfinger it. bars. Yeah. Is it good? And I cut them up and froze them. And this is them. And the reason we did that is so that we can make Butterfinger bar dust. So we'll put some in here. See, I said some. <laughs> I found the other half, where'd you go? I found the other half of bladder. Yeah, I know, it's under the... Uh, it's, <laughs> it's in the refrigerator. Yeah, all leaked out. Yeah. That's now this will be loud for a second. Boy, I'm a mess. And the reason we're doing this is, have you ever ordered Snickers ice cream in a store and you get vanilla ice cream with pizza Snickers bar in it? That's not Snickers ice cream. So this will taste like the ice, like the candy bar. Not, and you can do it with any candy bar. Kit Kat, Snickers. And you can hear when it's done, right? You, you know that there's no more big pieces in there. Now, I will take credit for this invention, not the machine, but doing it this way. When I first started, I wanted to make Milky Way ice cream. So I took the Milky Way bars on the stove and heated them up slowly 
until they were all dissolved. Then I had a big kettle of melted Milky Way bars and uh, I added that to the batch freezer after it cooled off and made great ice cream. But then you're faced with Snicker bars and you're faced with uh, you know, Kit Kat bars and uh, Baby Ruth's, all the candy bars, and you can't simply melt them on the stove. It's an arduous process anyway. So I came up with the goal was to get, see these? If everything in the world is molecules, then you want as much of this to touch the cream as possible and dissolve so that the flavor, unlike a lot of people, probably Steve included, I don't care what my ice cream looks like. I don't care at all. I don't decorate the tops and none of that stuff. I care about what it tastes like and how bold the flavor is, how sweet it is, and uh, how refreshing it is. That's what I care about. Don't worry about it. So, now before you asked about formulas, well, here's a universal formula for cream ice. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. You're not writing. Why aren't you writing? You know this already? Three, two, one. Why aren't you writing? No pen? There's a pen right there on the floor. And she will kick it to you. Look at that, kicks it to you. So it's three, two, one for any cream ice in the world. Three quarts of water, two pounds of sugar. What's the other thing? One what? Uh, one quart of mix. Three quarts of water, two pounds of sugar, one quart of mix, and then whatever flavor you want. Today it's going to be baby uh, Butterfinger. <laughs> Butterfinger. So, what I say, three quarts of water? That's all right. <laughs> You're so helpful today. I don't have my assistant, so I have to do something. Three quarts of water. I'll tell you what you can do. Yeah? You get me two pounds of sugar. Uh, that's not in my contract. I didn't think so. I'll do it. <laughs> I'll get it for you right away. So three quarts of water. Two pounds of sugar. And one quart of mix. Well, good, good question. That means you're paying attention. I heard there's a test at the end. Speaking of tests, uh, Monday I have to take my food manager's test. Uh, and uh, I haven't taken one in five years, six years. So obviously I have to study and uh, not happy about it. Uh, you don't want to fail that because no. you look like a real yo in front of the whole class who's, you know, Olive Garden employees are there and macaroni grill and all this stuff. So. Monday, I have to take it. I haven't opened the book yet. <laughs> Most of it's common sense. I think so. And the last time I got 84, which was good. I was happy. Now, they give a class two hours before the test. And I'm sure they give you all the answers. <laughs> so uh, I should have done that, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just the online one. It took about an hour to go through a course and took the test. So got an 87. There you go. They have it online, so you can cheat. The manager? Oh no, because it's proctored. How is that? How is that done? They have through your camera. So oh, you through your, your camera. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. brother. You, you can't show the uh, off to the side the six chefs that you hired to assist you. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right. So now we're going to turn the machine on before we add the sugar. Now somebody said. How much of this do we add, right? You said that. I'll let you know in a minute. Okay. Uh, let's put this on. Steve, what's the here? Six and a half. But if we're shipping it to you outside the state of Florida, there is no sales tax. It'll be based on where you're located. So if you're in Miami, you're going to pay seven or something. 
Um, if we ship it to Georgia or Alaska, there is no sales tax collected by Emory Thompson. So unlike Macy's, we don't have stores in every state, so we don't have to collect the sales tax. Adds up to a lot. Now, how much of this do we add? I'm going to weigh it first, see what we have here. First, we'll tear it. Know what that means? Okay. Okay, the answer is... Hmm? <laughs> We're going to add all of this. This is just under three pounds of Butterfinger bars. I checked my recipe for Butterfinger ice cream, and let me make sure of this. Uh, I think it was six pounds of bars, so we're using a half batch here. So we'll use three pounds of... Why are you frowning? No. Okay. So we'll use three pounds. <laughs> Butterfinger, six pounds in a 24 quart. So therefore, we will use this. This is going to be, I can tell it's going to be good. Look at all this stuff. Amuse the crowd while I'm doing this. <laughs> Sorry? Um, 8,650 plus shipping. It's the best storage in the world because it's, um, it's so incredibly cold. If you're a fisherman, you put some fresh trout in there and they're gonna be good for six months. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Or beef, anything that you want, you know, super, super cold. <laughs> nope. Okay, uh... Just for the edification of the class, how hard or complicated was it to clean up at the end of the day, as far as the machine? Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Uh, and that's what you want to do. It's a great feeling when you finish cleaning up and the machine, they did an amazing job yesterday. That machine glistened. Uh, and at, when you're done and you've sanitized it, sealed it up, washed everything, sanitized it, it takes probably 20 minutes, which is certainly no big deal. I've got it down to about eight minutes because it's, it's, some people don't do it. They don't take the door off every night and clean it. They don't take the gasket in here off and clean it. They don't, uh, they don't do all the things that I think should be done and then their product suffers and the machine suffers. This is the heartbeat. This is like that Corvette engine that you just bought a Corvette around. Uh, you know, you just want it to, when it's closed up at night and it's sanitized, and then you come in the next day, it's a whole different ball game. Now I have somebody I know who operates an extremely successful store in South Florida, selling only cream ice. And he has two Emory Thompson 44 quart machines. And he pays people at night to run them almost round the clock. He has about 150 flavors of cream <coughs> ice every day on an electronic board in the store. And <coughs> when I was there, the machines were not clean. But that's your decision, you know. And as far as the employees, they'll follow your lead. So that's it. It's not hard to clean it. 
nobody does the door every night. And the door was, is like fun, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> who is it trying to get it? Uh, you. No, he's not here. No, he's not oh, okay. Here. Not here. okay. Uh, it's a knack, but you know, you just got to pay attention, but it's okay. Let's see what this stuff tastes like now that it's mixed up. What are you reading? Uh, one of my own formulas. I'm really impressed by it. I'm impressed by my formula for grape nuts. Why are we going to loop this tape about how I don't want to do this, it smells, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want to, you can have her, she's too fat for me. Yeah. Are most of them selling to like a restaurant by the gallon? I have most of them doing what I showed you this morning using the six liter pan. Uh, a gallon is uh, too much space to take up. It's also too much waste because these are not coming back to you. Right. There's not a chef on earth who's going to wash your containers and keep them in his overly tight kitchen. So you need a way to distribute them like those plastic inserts from the gelato supply that, uh, to be I able to like do that. I felt like it was too watery. Uh, I don't think anyone's ever made Butterfinger cream ice water? before. Well, it's always ice cream. cream. Between what they sell so, uh, uh, yeah, just about. So I felt that it should be a little more, a little more body to it. But for the ice cream, it's always three, two, one. No. What? Uh, I went over this with July uh, with uh, Malcolm. Only for this, but you feel it's only need more body. You were certainly a good addition to the class. How about those two guys who came in at one o'clock? <laughs> yeah, the question over here uh, is from me. What? Which would you rather sell, a uh, gelato pan to a restaurant or individual scoops and why? I don't understand. Would you, what would you rather sell in your business? You're in the ice cream business. Would you rather sell those six liter gelato pans to a restaurant or the contents of that six liter pan in scoops? And How would I, you do that? How would you sell it in scoops? One scoop at a time. How are you going to do that to a restaurant? I don't understand. <laughs> well, he's just saying, would two, you rather two sell separate a scoop shop or to retail a or wholesale? Which would oh, you take? Okay. Well, I yeah, I gave you my take on wholesale. Wholesale. But you promote wholesale a lot of times, right? In addition to a very strong retail. Okay. I mean, if someone's knocking down your door begging you to do it, and you can get $40 a gelato pan, why not? I'll but tell I you don't why go, not. I don't go out and look for it because <laughs> I want the retail. Yeah. You, you would rather have a scoop shop than to try and like, start out selling to restaurants and other suppliers? Restaurants don't pay their bills. And Don't they have forget, every, they have every excuse wholesale, on, uh, under the sun why they won't pay their bills. When you sell wholesale, that's one reason. You've got to chase the money. But the, the big reason is you're losing your identity. You're selling what your baby to a company that doesn't really care about it. They don't take care of the product. It's oftentimes not your name on it anymore. And you're making less money than retail. Uh, you're going to sell a gallon for $40. Well, why do that? Um, it's also going to be icy because they're not going to take proper right, care of it. They don't take care of it. They leave they the cover off of it. What if I sold it in a four-ounce individual container with a lid, and that's like it's got my label on it, they have to sell Restaurant's it. Restaurant's not going to sell sorry, it. I'm sorry. I don't want to go to a fancy restaurant and right. be handed a Dixie cup. <laughs> right, hand the Dixie cup. I won't eat it. I won't do it. Tell me why. Why would you want to do it? Uh, why would I? I mean, I just want to sell the ice cream, but for the restaurant, uh, we need some I don't sugar. know. I, I think, think it's a high-level restaurant. It's like a barbecue place. Maybe they what? have an ice cream. We need sugar. From, just stop. Local You're on gelato. I no, I shut it. Okay. Sorry. Why am I on gelato? Who I have, changed this machine? Uh, I used it last. Oh, well, come on. <laughs> gelato? Well, see. You sound why like were you Paul. Playing, I'm why sorry. Are you playing I'm sorry. I didn't Look, put the seat. Says I'm sorry. I didn't put the seat back. Change it to, to ice cream. Speed is right, but it still says gelato. All right, you're okay. okay. So, in my opinion, wholesale is not what I want to do. You may want to do it. It's not what I want to do. The whole joy 
and you, you guys saw it in the store the other day, the whole joy is that people coming in and you serving them ice cream and them being happy and, and you get that feedback right away, you get the money right away, everything works. I don't know, just, just me. All right, so what else? I did add another quart of uh, dairy to this because when I tasted it, it was thin in my opinion. It was a little watery. I'm gonna try it again. That's better. I still think it's gonna be better as ice cream, but so be it. It'll taste like uh, Butterfingers. Start over. When all, when all else fails, reboot. Yeah, I'm sorry, I messed you up. <laughs> That's all right. And are you really sorry? No. Just happy it got going again. <laughs> Homemade. Yeah, it was. Um, all right, any other questions before? Yes. From a salesman's perspective, what do you say your base flavors are compared to like your custom flavors? Your vanilla, chocolate, strawberries? No. For years, I never sold vanilla ice cream, and I still don't. Well, now we sell chocolate, but it's it's not your regular chocolate. I don't know. I just uh, I want to be. I, I serve a flavor to give you an example: peanut butter and jelly ice cream. It's peanut butter ice cream, crunchy peanut butter ice cream, and there's a variegate, a swirl of Welsh's grape jelly running through it. Uh, nobody else has that. Even Oreo cookie, everyone sells Oreo cookie ice cream. Well, I didn't want to sell what everyone else has, so I added pieces of Nestle Crunch Bar in it and call it Oreo Crunch. Uh, everyone has cheesecake ice cream, uh, strawberry cheesecake ice cream, cherry cheesecake ice cream. I made turtle cheesecake ice cream with <coughs> cheesecake ice cream with caramel and fudge running through it. Uh, I just, I, you know, it's... You'll have fun with this. Uh-oh, the dogs are in. <laughs> the dogs are in. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> Come on, Sammy. You don't give up, do you? <laughs> Everybody, Paula Thompson. I mean, this... Uh, We sell uh, no Italian ice, but we sell some cream ice. We sell an adult flavor cream ice, cherry amaretto. We made that the other day, right? Yeah. Cherry amaretto. Yeah. And that's whew, way out there. It's very good. Uh, we have a separate board for adult flavors and regular flavors. And obviously, it, there's a sign on there over 21 for the adult flavors. Uh, soon, we're going to be making pina colada, uh, which is obviously orange, pineapple, coconut, and rum. Uh, we make a, a world famous coconut ice cream called Totally Coconut, and soon we're gonna make uh, coconut rum ice cream. Uh, but it's, you know, look, I gotta tell you, everybody starts with my book, there's 20, 25 recipes, and everybody starts with those, but it doesn't take you long to say, ooh, what if I, ooh, how about if we add, ooh, what if we don't? And that's great. Those two kids in the back, from San Diego and New Jersey, they are understanding how great owning your own ice cream place is. It's unlike anything else. It's not like you're selling computer chips or ladies' shoes or curtain rods or anything else because of that one element. There's two elements that you don't get in all of your jobs right now, art and fun. And if you can add art and fun into a job that pays you enormous amounts of money, uh, you got it made, don't you? So, you know, do it. Get, get it made. It's, it's, a, it's a future for your family, that's for sure. Because when you are all old, like me, you're gonna turn it over to your kids who will chomp at the bit to get this. Ooh, I get grandpa's ice cream store to run. They may run it into the ground, but hey, you left a legacy. What do kids know, right? Well, another aspect of that is, um, and I hate to really say this, but we do very well in a recession. 
the ice cream business is thrives in a recession. Oh, uh, there is no recession for ice cream. Yeah, there is no recession. Uh, they do very well because I do well on the machines because people have hit their 40s and they've been fired three, four, five times or let go or downsized, whatever polite word they want to use, but they're out of a job. And they just throw up their hands and say, that's it, honey, we're going to go work for ourselves. And they are highly motivated. They're going to make the business work and they're wildly successful. Why it works, though, is just like coming out of the, it's the identical to coming out of the COVID virus. Uh, people had been cooped up um, in their house and they wanted to get out and the place they wanted to go was a bar to get a beer with friends or an ice cream parlor with the family. Well, once the COVID is over uh, and if a recession ever sets in, which sometime in your life it will, I've been through, through three or four of them, um, you're, you're not cooped up in the house, but you're economically cooped up. You can't afford to go out to dinner with the family. You can't afford to go to a movie but you can always afford to go uh, to get an ice cream. And uh, it becomes, you know, maybe you don't do it you know, three times a week, but it becomes a special treat. Jeff and I were talking this morning about pricing and uh, size of a, a scoop. And it really comes down to this, a $20 bill. If a father uh, and his wife and two kids can go into your ice cream parlor and everybody gets a nice big portion of ice cream and it costs him one of these, uh, that's great. He feels very proud that he was able to pay for that. The kids have a nice time. If you happen to be able to add in the picture window and make ice cream on uh, Friday or Saturday night, that's great too. Um, uh, it becomes very important. And, and just on the money part of it, Jeff and I were discussing that if some bean counter convinces you to raise your price from $5 a scoop to $6, uh, now he's clumping out, he's doling out Twenty-four dollars. Well, that's that's a that's a t uh, twenty, and oh, I got one, and another five. Um, and I'm making a point here. <laughs> if they weren't stuck together, uh, so now he's got to dole out two of these, a twenty and a five. And so the next time it happens, he's thinking to himself, "Well, I don't know, honey. That's 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 a lot of money because it's no longer just one bill. It's it's two large bills. It's a twenty and a five, and then it starts to hurt. So." $5, we would have said a few years ago, was outrageous. Jeff didn't, but I would have. Uh, but the fact is, you increase the size of the portion to uh, five ounces instead of three, and they're getting a really nice uh, frozen dessert at an affordable price. Oh, and that $20 bill in your accounting includes taxes. So maybe it would come down to like 1946 plus tax. Don't ever give up the taxes. You've got to pay the taxes to the state, otherwise they come after you and that's not worth it. Um, but that $20 bill is magical and you'll do very well in, in bad times because uh, we always, ha you, know, you know, they came up with an expression, what was it, 2008 we had some kind of uh, shortage of gas and, also, and it was in the summer and everybody talked about it. They made up a new term which was really cool. They called it, I'm taking a staycation. Anybody remember that? That was where you stayed home and just used everything that was nearby you, the parks, the, the river, the ocean, if you had an ocean. Uh, you, you had a staycation, you took a, the, the worst of all possible times and it turned it into something good. And McDonald's is, it can easily be $30. It's very expensive. But, and it's just junky food. People would rather have your spectacular ice cream. It's a real treat. I mean, uh, you know, no, nobody, no dad screams, hey, kids, let's go to Taco Bell. Sorry, Taco Bell, but, you know, we're not that interested. They say, but you say, hey, let's go uh, down to Jeff's homemade ice cream, and now you're talking some excitement. So uh, we're a very safe, stable business to be in. And, yes, if you needed to, you could always expand into other areas, ices, dairy-free, some wholesale. Um, be careful of your ego. Don't let your ego get you. Uh, as soon as Whole Foods, as soon as someone says you ought to be in Whole Foods, everybody's in Whole Foods. That's their MO. That's their modus operandi of let everybody in and then the economy shakes out who's good and who's bad. So if you survive two months, they'll let you into another store for another two months. Maybe after a year you're in six stores and your ego, you're scratching your head out here that you're calling me up and ordering 10 machines when you don't need them. And I'm going to tell you, you don't need them. Don't overexpand. Uh, so stick to the mon pause. They may not be as glamorous, but if you had on wholesale, if you had six so mon pa delicatessens, 
uh, or convenience stores or specialty food shops selling your pints of ice cream, that's great advertising. Mom and Pa love you. They're making $2 a pint, you're making $4 a pint, and the customer is getting a product that he really loves. I failed to mention that earlier today, but the Mom and Pa specialty shops are a great way to expand your brand. And it's not going to be ruined by the waitress or the, the waiter uh, serving your ice cream in Le Pantier. It's going to be um, taken care of by Ma and Pa, and they love you that there is no two-week uh, lead time and, and a ton, big, ten tub minimum like Hagen does. They call you up Friday afternoon. Hey, we just ran out of mint chip, and it's going to be a big weekend. Don't worry about it. I'll run them over to you. And that counts for more advertising than you could ever do. They're going to love you. So there are ways to expand the business. And here comes the product. I'm going to use this machine, Jeff, for my final flavor. No. Um, gelato is a very interesting subject. Uh, I know a lot about it because this cabinet is made by uh, Capigiani, my frenemy, uh, one of their companies. They own about 70 companies. And I needed a hardening cabinet, they needed a sales outlet, so we got together and said we might be competitors, but we have a great idea. So I have a lot of knowledge of, of them. And Thanks. their product <laughs> Their gelato batch freezers sell all over Europe, used to be all over the world, but it's shrinking quickly. Americans, uh, Americans have American-style ice cream with lots of cookies and candies and stuff in it. Um, and we, we want, uh, that's the kind of product we sell. Uh, American ice cream is more popular now in uh, Africa, uh, the Middle East, Asia, um, not so much in, in South America because a lot of it came, them came from Italy and Europe, uh, but the majority of people in the world want American style ice cream. And uh, so gelato technically was a fad. It came in the 90s, it almost wiped out my company because I had. Gelaterias. Yeah, I hadn't invented the infant overrun control yet, so I uh, couldn't take my machines down slow enough. Now I can. It's been 23 years. Um, and uh, everybody was going to Europe and saying, oh, the gelato, oh, it's fantastic. And I'm a wise ass. I would say, so let me ask you a question. I got the th number third, th third Avenue mugger mover subway out my back window in the Bronx. And I said, where does a Heineken beer taste better? Does it taste better underneath the Third Avenue L, or that stands for elevated, the Third Avenue L, or does it taste better uh, on a Caribbean island? Well, it always tastes better on, on an island. And, it tastes, and so the gelateria tastes better when you're on vacation in Italy. Uh, that point didn't always fly, but the, the, the real point was it's not what Americans eat. So I do very little uh, in gelato, and I'm selling more machines than anybody. So I can make gelato. I would do some gelato, but my, I guess my biggest point is... 38-year-old mother walks through the door. She's got her five-year-old daughter with her. And I can guarantee you that daughter is not pulling on her mother's dress saying, Mommy, can I please have a tiramisu? That's not happening. The kid wants, the child wants uh, moose tracks, mint chip, uh, Oreo cookie. And a big danger in business is selling what you want to sell instead of what's going to sell. I mean, if you want to sell a product that you're convinced on, uh, you'll be very happy in business, but you'll be broke. You've got to sell what the public wants. That's extremely important. So you can try gelato, and, and there are exceptions to every rule. There's Il Laboratorio in Manhattan, biggest selling gelateria probably in the United States. But I must have a thousand machines in, mid, in uh, the five boroughs of New York. That's one store. I've got a thousand pastry shops. And so you, you've got to go where the money is. Uh, if you've got a flavor, I make uh, coffee banana ice cream. It's horrible. It's a horrible combination. And I make it on purpose because nobody's going to steal my ice cream. It says coffee, banana, no one's going to touch it. So I always have a supply of a tolerable ice cream to eat. And sometimes you have to do that in business. You know, I don't build soft ice cream machines because that's not what we're known for. It's not my market. Steve, 
Steve, what about ice creams that are made at a lower overrun or lower RPM? They're excellent for, um, absolutely excellent for pints. Uh, but haagen again, I put haagen in business, and I'm quite proud of that. Um, they had a bunch of stores when they first opened, all across the country. They're all closed. They're all gone. There might be one or two that they leave open uh, for advertising purposes because it says haagen -Dazs. Same problem with Ben & Jerry. Ben & Jerry stores are failures. Their, their ice cream and pints is an overwhelming success, and that was us too. Um, the problem is the stuff is so heavy and so dense that when you make a dense ice cream, which this machine does, a four ounce portion is going to be in the bottom two thirds of the cone. It's not going to be falling off the cone. It's going to be down there like nuclear waste. It is so dense and your yield is much less, of course, because you, now you're putting uh, less air in. It's so heavy that people first look at it and they say, five bucks for that? What do you think you are, a French restaurant? Come on, you're cheating me. And then also you would see outside of their store half finished cones because the stuff is so heavy that people couldn't even finish the four ounces. So it's being thrown away right outside the store, which gives a bad impression. It costs way too much for the size that you get. Jeff's is falling off the cone and people eat with their eyes. It's the most wonderful ice cream for pints uh, and that's what I do. But for a retail sale, it's, 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 a, it's a real bad idea. And all you have to do is just take a tour of the country, go around to some of the big names, go see Molly Moon uh, up in Seattle, go see Byright Creamery in San Francisco, ICI in um, Berkeley, uh, go all over the country, go to Houston, go to Dallas, go to Memphis, and where you see homemade ice cream, the, the odds are very high, it's an Embry Thompson. But the main thing is, it's a super premium ice cream. No, Jeff's doing maximum overrun. I'm doing super premium, Try about 65% overrun. <laughs> that, to me, is a happy balance. So you've, you've got to come up with something people can eat. I mean, you have, it's, uh, a filet mignon is fantastic, but are you going to sell more filet mignons at McDonald's at $30 each or, or the uh, double cheese Whoppers uh, over at uh, Burger King? Uh, you've got to go with what the crowd wants, and you have to go with your popularity, you know, your high-quality product. What's the RPMs on the super premium? Again, it doesn't matter because it's only to my machine, but it happens to be 165. You take it to any other manufacturer, and they'll say, we don't even know what our RPM is. It doesn't matter. It's like saying, what engine is in Jeff's Corvette versus Jeff's Volkswagen? Uh, there's a horsepower difference, but it's, it's all in the performance. The, the, um, the Corvette gets them arrested, the Volkswagen gets them laughed at. But it matters for your machine, if I'm buying your machine. It matters for any machine. It, well, yes, because I'm the only one with the infinite overrun control. Right. Nobody else has this invention. So I can do any air content I want that is doable in nature. About uh, 35, 40 percent. I'm sorry. 35 to 40 uh, uh, percent butter overrun. I'm sorry, I meant lowest RPM. When you're 135. Running. And again, it doesn't matter. If I told you it was 97, would it matter? Or 135? Well, it matters because to me if I buy your machine and I want it at 135 versus 235. Yeah, but you can't go to Capigiani and say, I want, my, I want a machine from you that runs at 135. They would go, I don't huh? Go to well, well yeah. Right. It's only a number. They would talk in overrun, right? Right. Overrun is what counts because that's money in your pocket. Yeah. And that's also your low If you go to 100% overrun, then you put 10 quarts in, you're getting 20 quarts out. If you decide that you want it to run at 130, well, instead of getting 20 quarts out, you're going to get 13 quarts out. And there's seven quarts you're not making any money on seven quarts, almost a gallon and a half, times a year, that's uh, $40,000. It seems like the really big national companies that we know of now seem to run lower overrun products. That's correct. Uh, they have a closed system, and if you have a million dollars for the machine and three million to set up the peripheral that it takes to run it and makes 1,200 gallons an hour, you can go down to 20% overrun. 
uh, which is barely, it's, it's almost zero, zero is 17. Because of production efficiency, is that why they can do that? No, it's a pressurized machine. It's a narrow tube. I've got one out here that I'm, I build. Yeah, but why do they do it? Because they need to make uh, a million gallons a year. But it's slower. It takes longer to make those. They're yeah, fast. Why would they crank down their overrun if they're running a big machine like that? The big, because you want an, a, a pint of ice cream that weighs, you know, a heavy amount of weight. Gotcha. That's Hagen does today. Yeah. yeah. Ben and Jerry's, I guess, is the same. Right. It seems like Jenny's is like that. Salt and straw seems to be that way. No, like salt and straw is my machines. They are. Yeah, they are. Do they run super premium. I don't know what uh, I don't know what they're running, but that's all my machines. Always has been. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you know I can't stress enough. I got, I got uh, a question. I'll be right with you. It's with the machine, you turned it on with dirty with the water. It turned it. Thank you. I don't know why you did that. Uh, that was a mistake. That's a um, I don't know. I can't stress enough, but you'll find out when you get into business. Nobody walks through that door and says, that was the best air content I ever ate. Or that fat content, oh man, I, I'm going nuts. I love the fat content that he's making. That's not the case. They eat flavor. People eat flavor. Uh, I mean, you don't eat a steak and say, wow, that's wonderful texture of the filet mignon. It's so much better than the sirloin. You say, wow, the filet mignon's got better flavor than the sirloin. That's what people are eating. They're not eating air content. There, is, there has never been anybody who ate air content. But I think texture seems to play a big role in it. Well, uh, was this smooth enough for you today? Yeah, I think so, but this yeah. isn't the finished product. This isn't what you would eat at a scoop shop. This has got to now sit in a cabinet for overnight. It's going to then get smoother. And the flame, and Jeff and I, it's going to get smoother. Yeah, I mean, I had some at Jeff's shop, which was good. It's scoopable. The other thing is, uh, and Jeff and I disagree with this, but I have the science. The flavor will enhance after you make it. So use that you, word. Come on, use the word. Which one? Blossom. It'll blossom. Yes. <laughs> you you shouldn't taste ice cream coming out like this because the flavor hasn't expanded yet. Yeah. It takes overnight for and for the that's part of the that's the major part of the freezing process. The texture does not change in freezing, not one bit. What you put in, what you gets out of there and goes through there is going to be the same stuff. It does not change texture. Anybody who says it does, they don't know how to make ice cream or anything about it. What does change is the flavor. If I make vanilla for you, vanilla ice cream, you're going to say it's good, but Steve, you should have put more vanilla in. Taste it tomorrow, and you go, wow, that's real, that's real vanilla ice cream. The flavor gets stronger. You know, there's some foods like that. Soup. Soup gets better the next day. I got to keep moving because we're running out of time. What are you making? Um, we're making a cookie ice cream. Oh, the English biscuit cookies? Yes, the English biscuit cookies. Biscotti. Tut tut. tut. <laughs> you need any help? Uh, no, not biscotti, biscoff. Uh, no, I'm good. Remember the uh, the ice cream um, cookie? What, what is it? Speculoos. What? Speculoos. 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 Yes. Right. Cookie butter. Yeah, you mean the one that I invented and then you stole Correct. it. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yep. I stole it and then found a better way to make it, and it's a terrific flavor. Speculoos is a, a Dutch, Just I think it's Dutch, you, a term, and it's uh, you stole it. over there in Denmark or wherever it's from. They don't eat peanut butter, they eat cookie butter. And it looks just like peanut butter, but it's made with uh, like these cookies, these biscuit wafers. Wow, is it good. Cookie butter. I think the only place I found it is Trader Joe's or Whole Foods. Uh, Amazon has it too. Amazon. Well, Amazon has everything. Amazon has cookie everything. Cookie butter. Yeah. It's, uh, just try it once. It's extraordinary. And I make cookie butter ice cream. See, now you could never call it speculus, the ice cream. You wouldn't sell one server. Who'd buy it? Right, but if you call it cookie butter, it works. And man, is it good. It's a totally unique flavor. It's like a combination of a biscuit and a graham cracker. Very, very good. Okay, I'm ready to make this. What are you doing with alien sugar on the table? <laughs> Just showing people what they shouldn't buy, Jeff. Okay. <laughs> Did I give this out? No. Well, I'm looking for it myself. On the um, other side of the spoons. On the other side of the spoon. Okay. You're Is right. Is that it? Oh, you got good eyes. Yeah. Thank okay. you.
And what's it called? <laughs> Cookie butter ice cream. What do you know? There we go. We can come up with a better name. Um, all right, so pretty simple. We're going to put six quarts of mix in. Five quarts, so, excuse me. I made sure the gate was closed. Now, could you add chocolate chips to this? Oh, you could add, yeah, no, no problem. Either Giadelli or uh, Forbes. Don't, don't bother me with Toll House. Or Barry Calibo. Yeah, well, he's a, he's a wholesaler. Yeah. But no, I could buy from him. Okay, two tablespoons of cinnamon. And you don't have to write it down because I just gave it to you. Go into business together. One of you has to move. So just do it. Okay, that's the cinnamon. Blockhead vanilla, what is left of it, because Jeff used so much. And the cookie butter. Now this stuff is sticky. Um, yeah, speckled cookie butter. That's what we're using. It's very sticky. So I'm going to start the machine up. Stop. Home, make ice cream. Now I'm going to take it down a bit to super premium 160. Yeah, 165 is the rotation. Yeah, you want it? I gotta go get a spoon, I'll be right back. What kind of spoon? A uh, metal spoon. Oh. Da, 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 da. So this was good today, right? You had a lot of different things. The uh, uh, Butterfinger cream ice, I thought it was okay. You know, it was refreshing as hell. Uh, still better as ice cream. But you know, sometimes you eat a lot of ice cream and that's like a nice break. It had a lot of flavor. The, the three pounds was perfect. Are you born and raised in San, Francisco, San Diego? And I'm going to turn on the refrigeration. Huh? I'm going to uh, microwave it. Okay, now here's something you can't do with any other machine. I'm taking whole cookies and just dropping them right in. Everybody see this? You'll never see it on any other machine that you ever look at. I'm sorry? I do. I've been freezing for 55 seconds. I'm not wasting time. Okay, I got some cookies hung up in there. Um, so I'm going to use a Rubbermaid spatula. 
Not my fingers. Excuse me one second. You need anything? Uh, Christy. Could you get Christy and ask her to come in? I need help. Like uh, the absent-minded professor, right? That's <laughs> great. What's that? You're like the absent-minded professor, which is great. It's, a, it's an innocence. I'm just speed. And you think anything goes. Yeah. You're not Christy. <laughs> what, do you pack a bag to go to the bath? Just kidding. Help you, with you should see when I cook. Whew. You need any help with anything? Uh, no, so far so good. Okay. Here she is now. You got to mic it. You were supposed to do it before you started. It doesn't before. matter. It won't even go in. What I were cook, those two jars of? Cookie I cook butter? almost every night, and uh, I use every pan in the house. We have, I have a great deal going with Paula. I do all the cooking, and she does all the cleaning. cleaning. What were those two jars? Cookie butter? Yeah. Amazon? Speckaloos. Amazon? Yeah. No. Christy got it at one of the stores here. Hmm? Big Value products at Walmart. Oh, okay. Now, for the record, Jeff would still be mixing. I'm three minutes into the batch. Whoa. You multiply it times a day, and it's a lot. That's 15 minutes. Holy cow. And what I get per hour, that's a that's lot of true. savings. And you do get the big bucks. <laughs> I can't afford me. What's in that bucket underneath the machine? Oh, who knows? That's, that's bilge water. <laughs> Wow, they never stop. <laughs> what are they called? Hmm? What are they called? I don't know prices. No, what are they called? Oh, um, Biscoff. Biscoff. B-I-S-C-O-F-F. -F. Biscoff. No, the it, two it's of them very highbrow if you... Husband and wife. It, it's very highbrow if you come from Westchester County, New York. You, you can't just serve Oreo cookies. You've got to serve Biscoff. They look like an Oreo cookie. No cream filling, though. Here, let's pass these around. You can all have one so you can see what it tastes like. Thank you. You're welcome. That's better. Phew, we made it.
Mmm. Going in the sink. Ha! Ah, that is so good. Any questions? This is our last flavor, and then I'm going to give you a tour of this building. So this is your chance. Um, I see some people make like candy Italian ice, and they use like Swedish fish or sour cream. So yes. How do they do that? Uh, you're just buying the candy. They melt it down. No, I put half into the machine. I freeze them first. That's that's Jeff's trick, and it works great. If you just throw them in the machine, they're all gooey. Uh, but if you freeze them first and turn them into a powder, they hit the cold product and now they're dispersing as a powder so the flavor's all there. And then we add the Swedish fish or other products as it's coming out. Or you can put them in at, say, 13 minute batch, probably about nine minutes. They're, the Swedish fish are not gonna break up. And so now when you scoop it, you've got the candy but you've got the background flavor. Um, something like, or I, I make uh, candy cane ice cream at Christmas. And I am deathly afraid of a small infant getting a sliver of candy cane. So I take my candy canes, I freeze them, and then I use, use Jeff's method. I use the, uh, uh, the blender and uh, grind them up into a powder. It's not as pretty looking, but you, know, you don't see pieces of candy cane, but they're just too dangerous for kids. Uh, but you have a beautiful uh, pink ice cream, and you've got the aroma of the candy cane and the tremendous taste. So it works well. Oh, this looks good. <laughs> and let's see what it looks like. You may call this a pan of ice cream. I call it a bribe for my banker. Okay, see how open and close cuts off like a knife went through it. That's ready. And I'm still at the slow speed. I'm going to turn off the refrigeration and pull it out. That's heavy. Now the last bit is there, so I want to get the last bit out. I'm going to um, take the speed up. Now if I wanted to fill pints, I could do the same thing. I could take it way down, and now I can fill my pints right there. Though it's not my desired method. There you go. Christy. Now, Christy on this one was going max for maximum flavor, so I put all the cookies in the machine. If I was doing Oreo cookie, I'd put half in and break them in with, between my thumbs and throw in pieces as it's coming out. But this one, you really want that flavor, so I, I want the max flavor out of this product. There will be no question but what this is. And that's it. There you go, a beautiful product. Yes? Have you ever made ice cream with cake, like a rum cake or? Oh yeah, cake? absolutely, it's great. Red velvet cake? Yeah. Carrot cake? You buy a whole cake and just stuff it in the machine. That's it. It's so terrific. It's How about what? It's not enough compared peanut to the brittle? refrigeration. Sure, why not? It, it comes out great. I'll get it, don't worry about it. Thank you. Oh.
I'll get the glory. I'll pass them around. Now you can add the spoons. Okay, yeah. What happened to that one? <laughs> oh, you're treading on thin ice, mister. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Couldn't resist. <laughs> all right, before we all leave for the tour and the end of the day, I just want to say something to Jeff and see if he doesn't agree. I, I would give this class uh, a definite 10. And he consider always says that. No, no, no. Don't you remember last class we gave him a 2? Oh, last night was oh terrible. they were, they let the zombie But uh, you told them out. they were a 10. <laughs> no, I <he> didn't. <laughs> Not a chance. Now they, <laughs> yeah, they were zombies. No, no questions. It was like they walked up, got ice cream, and left. Okay, you're good. Thank you. Steve, if you're selling pints, how do you figure out the sell by or the um, consume by dates on those? You don't. That's made up. <laughs> so you don't. You gotta have some yes. kind of sell by day, or you have to have like a produced by on day. Hand these out. You know. You want to put a produced on date on there? No, I don't, because what if it's been there for three weeks? Uh, people are going to say, oh, I thought it was fresh ice cream. It's been here three weeks. Yeah. There is only sale dates by law on uh, uh, food products like uh, beef that have mm -hmm. expir an expiration. You put this stuff down to zero or colder, and it has no expiration. At what point do you have to start listing ingredients if you're selling? The products? second you wholesale. Wholesale. And even that is made easier. Um, I could tell you a long story about it, but the short story is... Um, you won't be, you're protected because of Coca-Cola. You put milk, cream, sugar, skim milk, natural and artificial flavorings. And that just covered the law. Steve, because absolutely. this is the winner of the day. Oh, good. Tell Christy, she formulated it. Um, yeah, it's because uh, you don't want to have to make a whole bunch of different labels. This is definitely the winner of the day. <laughs> I, hold on, I'm blind in this eye, so I didn't see her coming. <laughs> It's not my fault. You're looking a little skinny. Gee, not much figure either. <laughs> Did you get one? Okay. Thank you. The better finger if it was ice cream, it would be even better. Huh? Hmm? It is the better finger. If it was ice cream, Yeah, we sell that at the store, Butterfinger ice cream. I'm actually going by there. My wife and I are going to go back to Okay. This one towards the closest one towards me looks messy, so don't take that one. Steal this sell leather to the guy at the Daytona flea market there. The leather guy. You can come back for more. Good, huh? Mm -hmm. So this will be on your menu next week and you'll mm -hmm. be taking credit for it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We've been doing this a long time. We're like an old married couple. <laughs> so Steve, you said only when you start doing wholesale, is that, does that mean like if you sell into a grocery store? Um, anytime you deliver it. Uh, anytime it's, it's made for consumption out off your premises. Yeah. But get a good attorney on that. I've seen people selling pints without ingredients on them, though, like it, if they just hand pack them right there at the scoop shop. There's a, that's fine, because you paid for it there in the scoop shop. Okay. That's the difference. If you deliver it to someone uh, or have it delivered... And what if they, it's and a third-party delivery, like uh, Uber Eats or something like that? Google. No, that, that's, pro that's probably going to be under, you sold it to Uber Eats, okay. Okay. and they picked it up at the store. What if they buy it off your website and then oh, come on. I think it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's gonna be the same thing. There's all these third parties. Well, what if somebody now? takes it by bicycle <laughs> over across the street and then they put it on a train? And... I think I've heard you say that exact same thing on the video. <laughs> <laughs> you don't think of anything. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I, like too many questions. I will tell you one thing to do in business. If you're gonna wholesale, talk to an attorney. Every business needs insurance to protect yourself, liability. But there's something called, if you haven't heard of it, umbrella insurance. 
And that is, let's say you've got um, $100,000 insurance on your business, but you're selling all these different places and someone, uh, something goes wrong with a product and someone gets sick or whatever and they're trying to come back to you. Your, your, your basic policy for your business protects you up to the 100000 but you can go a million or five million or 10 million up here. It's called an umbrella policy because it's hanging over this and it doesn't kick in until this is exhausted. Once they take your 100,000 and they sue you for five million, then uh, you're, you're protected. And I, I don't necessarily need that, but you in the food business should have that if wholesale is gonna be your main target. And the thing is, this policy costs a fair amount of money. The umbrella is like dirt cheap. Uh, because they know it's never going to get used. Uh, because these people don't want to pay out. And if they do, they want to pay out $20 instead of 100000 So they're the protection for the umbrella. But uh, I, we were in the South Bronx, so we always had insurance for everything. And my father's mantra was, buy all the insurance they'll sell you and just never plan to use it. My and, buddy in Long Island owns Andy's Italian Ice. Uh-huh. Yeah. And he, he wholesales all over. Yeah. He has like 130 flavors. He, he does the, um, he was talking about, uh, what is that, Swedish fish and all that stuff. He does that. And, yeah. um, and that's what we want you to do in Italian South ice. Patch kids and all that stuff. And he, he wholesales all over. He's got Why? a few of these machines. A few? So, yeah. Your wife. And he just Jeff it voted it the flavor of the day. It, freezes it and ships it. Yeah, he, he sells it in these. And then we'll get it back in the freezer. And then he also, I don't know if he goes smaller than this. He may. And then he does carts also. The inventor of this flavor. No, no. Yes. Well, yes and no. Um, this state, or this state, what's the name? This flavor was actually made at um, Penn State. So we do Penn State once a year, and it's going to, to, to the college and teaching a course on how to make ice cream. So uh, Slade, the vice president of the company, and I did all this. So you're eating a Penn State flavor. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Unless you hate their football team. <laughs> and then we never heard of it. But uh, I would give him a call, the guy at Andy's, and, and he, he, yeah, he's he's cool like that. He'll he'll give you all the. He doesn't hide nothing. He'll tell you. But the uh, like the candy flavor. You know? He'll say, yeah, well, he has them all listed, all the flavors, but he'll he'll talk about distributing because that's what he does. He puts it in yeah, refrigerated trucks and he's shipping that. So he makes deliver like mom and pop stores, like a he, Las Vegas. He, he delivers to people that want to even have an ice cream business. Hard for them to find. And sell to them. And they'll sell his stuff. No, there's there's very good ones around there. We have a whole list. Yeah, I've got some. Greenwood Industries would sell. That well, that's a good one. Okay, it's good. We've tried their products. What about? Okay. Yeah. Who will be the closest one to me in Philadelphia? Georgia has one, University of Georgia. There's about five or six. Okay. I don't know the names off the top of my head. That's easy. How about for the, the good syrups for the water? Right? That, that type of water. High rice. High rice. Mm -hmm. Okay, I got you. Preferably one in Philadelphia. Well, all, all that's listed on the website, right? All the distributors and suppliers. No, uh, not everything, but most everything. Yeah. I, I can't think of it all in one day, but it's, most of it's there. Yeah. We can call Christy and ask Christy for a list, right? <coughs> It's a big kid all over town. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there goes my diet. I just ate the whole portion. All right, we're going to give you a tour of the factory and then show you the exit. <laughs> Jeff, fun today, Jeff? Well, I had a blast. You know I did. Yeah, me too.